All right. We are now going to take on number uh, item number 12, and then we're going to come back. So we will now move on to discussion item 12, homeless diversion investing in an evidence-based cost-effective approach to address homelessness. Um, Vice Chair Lawson, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, <clears throat> great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, uh, excited to bring this item forward here today and uh, really appreciate um, the, the collaboration and support of so many partners throughout our region to work on this together. I think we all acknowledge that homelessness is a, a major challenge for our communities and I'm very, very focused on scaling up solutions that have proven successes and uh, really concrete and measurable outcomes and the ultimate metric of success, of course, is getting people into stable housing. Uh, diversion is a successful practice um, that has been underutilized um, in San Diego County. It has proven results because we're aiming to catch people at the moment of crisis so they don't fall further into a negative spiral. Since 2019, the Regional Task Force on Homelessness and their provider partners have diverted nearly 1,500 households from homelessness, which means nearly 2,000 fewer people living in shelters and on our streets and in canyons or in their cars. Uh, an incredibly striking statistic is that 85% of individuals who and households who receive funding uh, through the diversion program remain stably housed. <clears throat> The average cost of the program is also incredibly efficient. It's just about $1,500 per household, which compares with over $10,000 per person to provide a bed in an emergency shelter for 169 days, which is the average length of a stay. So we're really talking about um, $1,500 versus $10,000, and the ROI, I think, is just pretty extraordinary. Um, the results that the regional task force has been getting from their existing pilot program are very similar to a study that, that caught my interest initially, which was published by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on homeless diversion programs that they supported in Washington state. They found that per household, diversion costs um, about $1,700 and shelters about $11,000, and rapid rehousing vouchers are about $15,000. So, their data and their research tells that their diversion program had by far the highest impact and the greatest return on investment. Um, I think it's a helpful to provide an illustration, a concrete kind of uh, understanding of how a diversion program works. Because we're really talking about helping people right away instead of waiting months or years for them to spiral downward into additional trauma. Um, so. Uh, a good example would be if um, uh, that, was, that was shared with me, a story that was shared to me was uh, a young man who had moved here to San Diego County and was uh, living with his girlfriend and they broke up and he, and he moved out and he was living in his car and um, he had a job that he had to drive to and his car broke down and he was in the process of trying to get uh, into an apartment. Um, he had an accepted application and he needed a security dep deposit for the apartment. Uh, but he also needed to fix his car so he could get to work. And he didn't have enough money to do both. And so he was being forced to choose, you know, does he have a home and a, a, a roof over his head or is he homeless um, but his car works and he can get to work. And the diversion program, you know, can step in in a circumstance like that and, um, and help him put the down payment on the house, on the, excuse me, on a, the security deposit to get, to get into um, an apartment or uh, fix a battery really quickly for the car so that uh, someone can get to work and not lose their job. Uh, and then he can stay stably housed, uh, continue going to work, um, and doesn't end up in a downward spiral on our streets. So that's really what diversion does. That's how it works. Um, we, are, we know that uh, Regional Task Force has already uh, invested a lot in training homeless service providers, including over 150 frontline staff at organizations that work across our county. Um, and they also provide a little bit of flexible funding for, for these kinds of expenses. But the program has been very, very underfunded and they're out of money, even though they've made all the investments in training their staff. So this is really a wonderful opportunity for us to step in together 
as a county, as a network of um, <clears throat> leading homeless organizations across our region, including the San, San Diego Foundation, uh, the Lucky Duck Foundation, uh, and including some support and partnership with from the city of San Diego to put together a million dollars to move into a diversion program so that we can continue <clears throat> in investing in these very uh, cost efficient and fast and effective interventions to prevent homelessness. Um, I really wanna thank I mentioned already the San Diego Foundation and the City of San Diego uh, I would be remiss to not also um, really um, uh, say how much I appreciate the partnership of Steve Cushman and the Cushman Foundation, the Conrad Preppers Foundation, the Lucky Duck Foundation, and funders together to end homelessness, all of whom have committed to put money towards this endeavor uh, in partnership with uh, us at the county and the regional task force. Um, so the request and the item here today uh, that I brought to my colleagues is a request for um, $500,000, $350,000 would be for the diversion program itself um, that we that uh, would really be able to get in the hands of people that need the money the most. Um, and then $150,000 to do an impact evaluation because I am personally so uh, committed to making sure that every dollar we spend on homelessness is making the biggest possible impact. So we wanna collect that data, look at impacts, and figure out um, how we can uh, continue to learn from setbacks and scale up successes and uh, give our, our, um, our data office and uh, Ricardo and his team um, the, the resources they need to do, to do an impact assessment and, a, and a, an evaluation. So hopefully we can continue scaling up this program here in San Diego County and do our part to keep people from falling into homelessness in the first place. So um, again, it's really exciting um, to have an initiative that has such broad and deep support from our funder community and our homeless advocates and experts um, and is able to invest in a data-driven, uh, proven solution uh, that has uh, really strong evidence around uh, returns on investment. And then in addition to that, continue to gather more data and evidence about what's working um, so that hopefully we can uh, scale this up um, if, if we find out um, that, that the impacts are what they, we hope that they are. Uh, so with that, um, I would uh, make a motion to adopt this item and uh, appreciate the support of my colleagues in moving this forward. So thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Um, public comment? Thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. We have 12 requests to speak in this item, five in person and seven requesting to speak by phone. Also note that we received 16 e-comments, 13 in favor, one in opposition, and two neutral. Any members of the public that requested to speak in item 12 by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speaker, starting with the individual in favor, followed by the individuals in opposition of this item. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'd like to invite forward Paul the Bold, followed by Mark, Truth, Consuelo, and a speaker slip with the name Hermes. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Hi, Paula Bold. If evidence-based means actual observation and getting rid of all the data-driven crap you've pushed, uh, apparently it does, that's great. Um, I mean, look at all the money you've wasted on data-driven crap, and look how far it's gotten us. Um, I approve of giving more money to the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, the RTFH. However, I must say I do see a few caution flags. The agenda says over the past four years, RTFH has found that on average $1,500 in one-time flexible funding was enough to keep 85% of households stably housed, but um, does not that cost increase as the supply of housing decreases and rents rise? And there is inflation to factor in as well. Another matter is that the RFTH did not include school kids in their homeless count. In fact, I asked them specifically. None of this should matter in the end, though. It sounds like a good and helpful program. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the next speaker, please. 
Mr. Truth here to patch all the leaks and stop the inflows of lies. The point in time count consists of faulty stats from only one night, otherwise known as data-driven deception. And building homes is not the answer. Building rehab centers for substance abuse treatment is the answer. Throwing people into housing with harm reintroduction mistreatment services where they're provided drugs, pipes and needles is not the answer. It's been making the streets less safe. And stable housing can't be stable for people with addictions. It just provides a hidden place to get high. As item says, our regional homeless response system is like a leaky boat. The boat will continue to sink until we focus on patching the leaks and stopping the inflows. Well, you know what else is a leaky boat, Tara? The political foundation you've been floating upon. You're on a sinking ship and you don't even realize it. You're at your own moment of crisis when you reference any organization like Building Changes that is funded by the Gates Foundation. That's evidence that you're spiraling out of control. Bill Gates is the guy that said all kinds of crazy stuff, including this. The world today has 6.8 billion people. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. You see, this item is nothing but the continuation of the county's homeless inaction plan and overall framework for extending homelessness. Nothing's been working. Might as well quit while you're behind. The Regional Task Force on Homelessness has literally been using money from every taxpayer in the state to pay for people's moving expenses and even car repairs. And the claim today that is that another $1 million can be wasted from local partnerships. But there are actually groups propped up by both the county and the city of San Diego wasting more taxpayer dollars. It's just, it's 500000 just to evaluate this program. So let's save money. We can just scrap it now. And I'm going to argue if diversion is a light touch by government, then this item is physical and emotional abuse and assault. That needs to stop. No, thank you. Next speaker, please. Consuelo, uh, whatever happened to Project 25? In 2013, two years into the program, Project 25 participants had taken 600 fewer ambulance rides, uh, were in the ER 1,100 fewer times, and spent nearly 1,000 fewer days in the hospital compared with the, year be the years before they entered the program. The cost savings to the hospitals alone was more than $2 million. Not a single Project 25 client returned to the street. Everyone who entered the program remained housed, and uh, several participants have died, including um, uh, hold on, whatever. But what the natural they died from natural causes in their own apartments. All participants became self-sufficient enough to be transferred to less intensive case managements. Um, it was more than evident that this project, this program worked. And for that reason, and that reason alone, their funding was lost. This is what local government wants. They don't want evidence of anything working. They want total reliance on them. And uh, it's lucrative. Homelessness is very lucrative. Project 25, you don't know about it, Nora? Look into it. Next speaker, please. Mark, did you know we were on non-agenda comment when you prohibited Michael's critique as off-topic, Nora? She's not even listening to us. Um, so this is completely, uh, regarding agenda item 12, um, it's a waste of time and Tara was just absolutely full of shit on so many things. Um, you can't solve the problem if you're not addressing the cause. And the cause is the Federal Reserve. Jeff uh, Thomas Jefferson's direct quote, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered, end quote. So uh, if people see this, th these are YouTube titles of videos. If you guys see Zeitgeist at Denim from 6 minutes and 40 seconds to uh, 24 minutes, and I'm not addressing the supervisors, although it would be wonderful if any of them saw this, but I think some of them know and, and uh, have uh, bad intentions for the United States personally. That's my opinion. But 
Uh, so I, this for the people's benefit, if you see this video from six minutes, 40 seconds to 24 minutes, you'll understand how the world, uh, the Federal Reserve works and what a scam it is. If you see this, um, Rosa Corey, you'll understand. Is that item 12, sir? Yeah, you, excuse me, yes, this is in, uh, directly related to homelessness because this is what's causing it. And uh, the government and the direction it's going is not interested in helping America. You need to see these other videos too real quick. And uh, I, I'm out of time, but Sandag is definitely doing a lot to promote. Next speaker, please. Barely made it. Hermes here, that's the name, Hermes. Here, talking about, what is this, 12? Sorry, give me a second. So we want to give out more money, increasing basically cost of homing for everyone else more. More times that you give out money, people are going to raise the prices. We've seen this with colleges. We've seen this all over the place. Congratulations, you are kicking more people onto the streets. Talking about help, I've been asking for it for years. You haven't given me shit. On top of that, I don't believe you guys are here for us for one simple reason. The simple reason is you are hiding fraud. End of question. You choose not to have reporting districts so you could hide your agendas. Much like this, much like all the other ones. First time ever we did not have reporting districts for Newsom's election. Now we're going to get rid of cars because he saved his ass. Thank you guys for hiding fraud, lying to the people saying it doesn't exist. We all know it's true. And then sending cops to my door because you don't like my message. That's bullshit, Claudia. So that is the issue that I have with you guys. And I will make a poster explaining everything that I've told you multiple times. I have a couple great pictures to throw on the back of it to force the media to cover it. I will get the media to go after you guys. Trust me on that. Have fun. Now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll start with our first caller. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Vargas and Supervisors. I'm Jordan Latchford, the Government Affairs Manager of the Downtown San Diego Partnership, here to express our strong support for Item 12. The partnership is deeply committed to fostering the economic prosperity and cultural vibrancy within the city's downtown area. As the managing organization for the Queen and Safe Program, ESDP plays a crucial role in ensuring the region thrives. We have strong confidence the action presented today will provide nearly 800 individuals with the support they need to avoid a prolonged and costly experience of homelessness and instead quickly remain in or in, in transition to stable housing. We would like to express our gratitude to Supervisor Lawson Reamer for bringing this important program forward and taking the lead on this issue, as well as the Cushman Foundation for their advocacy for our unsheltered population. As a current service provider housing over 3,500 individuals through our Family Unification Program, we are grateful for the partnership with RTFH to make this diversion program such a success. We urge the board to move forward with allocating these funds to RTFH. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Sandy Muskowski. I'm with Lived Experience Advisors, Voices of Our City Choir, Heal Network, and Run California. And I feel grateful to Tara Lawson Reamer for bringing this bill forward. Our data from RTFH has demonstrated the success of the program that we've had in place 
and we must expand and continue this program. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Christina Selder, Director of Government Relations for Serving Seniors. Serving Seniors strongly supports this proposal, preventing homelessness for older adults by intervening at the critical moments before they become unhoused is not only cost effective, but spares enormous physical, mental, and emotional trauma for the older adults. Our thanks goes out to Supervisor Lawson Reamer for her leadership on this issue. We're also most appreciative of all the actions of this board, especially Chairwoman Vargas and Supervisor Anderson, to come up with solutions to remedy older adult homelessness within our county. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Hello, this is John Brady with Lived Experience Advisors. Today is World Homeless Day. What a perfect day to be doing this uh, item and approving it. Thank you to Tara Lawson Reamer for putting this on the agenda and arranging all the funding uh, from the various funders. It is critical that we stop the influx of people into our homeless system and keep them in their homes, particularly our seniors. 588 people died on this on our streets last year in the county of San Diego. We will be honoring them tonight at 6 p.m. and hope that all of you can join us here at the county administration on the southwest lawn corner of Ash and Harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Now here from the next caller. I love it how we are, you know, taking pointers from people who want to um, depopulate. It means that whatever you're set out to do is going to work. <laughs> um, it's hilarious. Um, homelessness, diversion, and best and evidence-based cost-effective approach. You guys are good. You love the words, right? And it's like as long as we spend $150,000 to evaluate the program, and collect data. I mean, what were you using before um, to determine what you need? Was it not data? Um, is it not good enough data? And so you need to get more data somehow, and that's going to help more people. I really think that everybody needs this help because you're basically diverting everybody into homelessness um, with everything that you're doing, uh, making it so that they can't even feed their children. Um, but it's good. So as long as we, you know, do some data and collect more data, um, I really don't understand where the rest of the money is going. Is like, is it three hundred and fifty thousand dollars that you have left? So is that going to go to these eight hundred individuals, and they're going to get six hundred and twenty-five dollars, or I mean, four hundred and thirty-seven, or is it going to be five hundred thousand that they're getting? You guys aren't very clear, but it's okay because as long as it's just smoke and mirrors, and you may, like use words that are good to pull on the heartstrings of people, they're going to believe that you're actually going to help homelessness. Gosh, I mean, imagine if we really helped it. That'd be crazy. We don't have help for you guys, but we do have help for people seeking asylum. It's good. Oh, man, you guys are really good at destroying stuff. Um, I'm just really proud of you. Um, you're doing exactly what you were set there to do. Um, you are doing exactly what the plan is, and you're doing a very, very good job of it. Um, and so... Yeah, I look forward to, um, you know, the day when you guys are behind bars. So that's going to happen, um, whether it's here or in hell. I don't know. It's up to you. Thank you. For the record, that speaker was Audra. And Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I love this idea. You know, we, we started this two, uh, two years ago. I think this board... Uh, really looked at homelessness, not just on how to address it on the streets, but how to avoid it on the streets. You know, we did the shallow rent subsidy. Most recently, we did uh, uh, co-locating seniors in the same home so that they could save their home, stay, stay fit, and, and keep involved. These are all great practices. Uh, I, I have two concerns that I'd like to address the author with. One is, we put this framework of ending homelessness together uh, a while back, and I'll print this way as you can see it. Uh, I learned that from some of the speakers to move it like this. But the uh, 
this is one of five elements, and I want to make sure that we prioritize all, because while we want to get the best return for our money, every human life is valuable, and every person is valuable. And I want to make sure that we don't give up on uh, safe parking, on some of the other par programs that we have, and for many of the people in safe parking, had they had this original program, they wouldn't need safe parking because they had to choose between their car and going to work and their down payment on uh, an apartment. So I love this. I just want to confirm that this doesn't reprioritize our key drivers in our framework in moving forward. That question? Yes, it is. Long-winded, <laughs> but I'll question all the same. It's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that framework's really important, and obviously we have to be... Um, multifaceted in how we tackle a very, very diverse homeless challenge that we face in our region. Awesome. And then the last thing is uh, we've had some programs like this where we created buckets and uh, nobody intended it to go the way it did, but some of our districts didn't get to participate in the buckets because by the time we got there, there was no money left for folks. And so what I'd like to do is offer a friendly amendment uh, so that everybody has access to this money because these programs are terrific money. Uh, pro I, I love all, everything you're trying to do here. And so let me just read it to you real quickly. In their negotiations with RTFH, staff should ensure that the contracts provided for an equitable geographic distribution of funding based on need. You know, my district has the second highest homelessness uh, and our numbers continue to grow. And I want to make sure that by the time, because we have three NGOs working in my district right now, of all the NGOs that are named in this program, I want to make sure that they have enough time to get their apply and bring some of that money back to the second highest population. And that population continues to grow because these people that you're trying to reach are on the cusp. And I know that uh, when I was doing the point in time count and I was working with my favorite uh, NGO, JoJo, he found uh, two sisters. One of the sisters he'd given help to, he didn't realize the other sister was on the cusp of homelessness. And sadly, he wasn't able to co-locate and help them both get off the street. So as one came off the street, the other one went to the street. A program like this would be very helpful keeping the whole family off the street. So uh, if, if you wouldn't mind taking that, I'd love to second this motion and get this money into the streets where people need help. Thank you so much, Supervisor Anderson, and thank you for your support. Um, I absolutely agree. We need to make sure that the funds are um, made available um, to, to those across the county who need them the most. Um, so as long as we're not <coughs> uh, tying the hands um, of RTFH and making it impossible for them to administer their program, as long as we're giving them um, you know, making sure that they can administer the program successfully. I think I want to make sure that they know that our priority is that this doesn't just go to one district, that this goes to the whole of the county based on, based on need. Um, because I do know, I was looking at the statistics, and I, knew that, I know that the city of San Diego, um, let, me, let me look at this again, it was really interesting. Um, the city of San Diego has about 63% of our homelessness uh, population, so that's obviously the greatest need. But the East County region, which you represent, has 17%. Um, and I do want to make sure that um, the folks in your region are getting the services that they need and, and aren't getting um, left out and excluded. So I'm happy to uh, so take that motion. I um, just want to make sure that uh, RTFH doesn't, you know, doesn't somehow get the signal that we're tying their hands or telling them it has to be exactly 63% and 17%. Uh, let's, you know, let's not be a little, not, let's not be crazy here. The, but. the, the key <laughs> is that no district has zero, right? I mean, that's the key because yeah. we did the garden program in two districts. By the time we got there, there was no money left. So I just think that as they distribute this money, they have to be thoughtful that we have to finish this race with everybody crossing the finish line together, and that one community only pushes it into the next community. So we really have to be there for everybody. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I'm happy to accept the amendment. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. We're not we're not given to give them these crazy quotas that they have to. It's a spirit of the exactly as, as Supervisor Anderson clarified um, that every everyone gets some of the money um, and no one gets left out. Um, but we're not straight jacketing them.
So and, if that, I mean, good, right? I'm happy to accept the amendment. I just want to note that for the record, because uh, I, I, I know that um, sometimes we can, uh, contracting can get a little bit um, particular. So, yeah. And the other, <laughs> to, just to finish, uh, I want to give you kudos for uh, bringing in all the private money, uh, foundation money along. I think that you need to spend a little more time on the city of San Diego. Their commitment was only 50 grand. Uh, we are substantially larger in commitment, and yet you just named the statistics that are most important. They have the greatest need, and they've given the least. And I know that they have a lot of priorities, but uh, perhaps we all could lean on our colleagues across the way in the city. Thank you. So, um, Claudia, does, does that work? I mean, if we accept this amendment, we're not going to be straightjacketing our TFH, right? No. Okay. Great. Okay, and then um, I think it's, this is fantastic, and I want to commend you for bringing this forward and support, uh, happy to support it. Just want to make sure that we are also uh, encouraging staff uh, to seek additional funding opportunities for diversion and prevention, and that's very clear, and that, uh, that they, because um, it might fit, you know, into different frameworks as well, so that they, they are able to prioritize all the recommendations that you have, so I think you know, that's part of it. So I just want to make sure it's clarified that way. Okay. All right. With that, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Chairwoman Vargas, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. Okay. All right. All right. We'll now hear discussion for number 11, ending taxpayer funded uh, so, item number 11, Supervisor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll take public comment first. Clerk. Thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. For item 11, we have 34 requests to speak, 20 in person, and 14 requesting to speak by phone. I also know for the record that we received 79 e-comments, 15 in favor, 62 in opposition, and one neutral. We also had seven individuals that registered their opposition but did not wish to address the board on this item. For any members of the public that requested to speak on item 11 by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, starting with the individual in favor, followed by the individuals in opposition. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'll be calling you in groups of five, so I'll ask you to please listen for your name. I'd like to invite forward Michael Brando, followed by Mark, Truth, Paul the Bold, Judith Vaz, and Aaron Soromoto Grassi. I've called your name, please come forward. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Truth, the Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program was approved by disgraced narcissist Nathan Nora and Tara back in 2021, costing Americans in the county $5 million every year to provide free lawyers and services to non-Americans. At the time, Tara had the audacity to cite the Constitution, a document she has actively trampled since she's arrived here. The best part of this item is the part that says, quote, the program did not create any eligibility criteria for participants to receive a county-funded immigration legal defense. The program is described by county staff as merit-blind, end quote. Merit-blind is right. Nobody getting it earned a darn thing. And more accurately is fiscal responsibility blind or even justice blind because Americans can't even receive free lawyers at this equal rate. County funds have been used to provide free legal defense in immigration court for non-citizens, otherwise known as undocumented illegal aliens with very serious criminal convictions. There were eight people trafficking controlled substances, one money launderer, 13 people with aggravated felonies, three people with controlled substance offenses, one human or drug trafficker, six crimes involving moral turpitude, that's bad stuff like murder, rape, aggravated assault, child abuse, or domestic violence, and two people had multiple criminal convictions. But are we to believe that no one saw this coming, really? I'm not sure why recommendation one is needed if there was already a report, but definitely get Helen working on Rec 2 and Rec 3 as soon as possible. Preferably, though, I would prefer that this whole pro program would just be ended. 
that people's money would be better spent on Americans. Example, helping people who've been dealing with toxic sewage from Mexico in Imperial Beach, Nora. Nora and Joel have had some of the poorest people in their districts, Joel being the most vocal about it. So anyone who supports this program as is wants poor people to suffer and die. I don't want anyone dying, so we need it. Not do that. Next speaker, please. Jim, who, <clears throat> my name's Mark. Uh, my time started early. Uh, so Jim Desmond, who's one of the people who spoke vehemently about this in the news, um, isn't even here today to vote on it. So that really sucks. And, uh, but also I noticed uh, the news station that covered the story, their title for the article actually didn't mention criminal. It just, uh, pretty much the same line without the, the word criminal, which makes a big difference. Jim was right in the paper, uh, in the article, when he stated that it's not really our responsibility as a city to take care of this. However, um, more importantly, he, uh, and it may be Joel, I'm not sure if it was Jim or Joel that mentioned, uh, I think Jim, that there are criminals with heinous crimes who have committed serious crimes who are be given, um, being given defense and uh, in hopes that they can enter, enter our country as citizens, you know, become citizens. And that's just absolutely absurd for an illegal alien to come here and, and commit heinous crimes and then us to pay taxpayer money to defend them uh, so that perhaps they could become a citizen is absolutely absurd and asinine. And Jim was absolutely right about that. Um, of course, he isn't here today to vote on this, which is not unusual that even, it it's, it's almost seems like you're all completely in on it, no matter what side you're on. Because even when one of you has the guts to say something about something that's obvious and true, you aren't here to vote on it and make sure your will gets done or the will of the people. Um, this is a circus. It's a joke. You should be ashamed. Next speaker, please. Okay. <clears throat> Paul Bold. Um, I'm opposed to this. Most countries act on a guilting proven innocent basis. It is heartless and un-American to deport anyone if they are, in fact, innocent. And they should be given a chance to prove it while not in jail. The question should not be whether they have these awful prior convictions, but have they served the time and are now good citizens? Do we really want to deport someone like Success Story 2 in the report whose crimes were 10 years ago and interfere with his supporting his family. Welfare might be more expensive, too. And um, we'd lose any positive contributions he might make to society. Also, while awaiting deportation, if in some kind of detention, prisoners in this country at least, probably have access to more uh, resources to prove their innocence if they are. Again, however, to spend work on defending someone who might be innocent is un-American. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, I'm not sure what happened with the forms, but I'm opposed to this, so I'm not sure if I can still speak. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Judy Vaz. I'm the Public Affairs Manager at Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest. In 2022, we were proud to support the launch of the Immigrants' Rights Legal Defense Program. And we see this program as an invaluable resource that provides legal aid to our most vulnerable communities. Legal representation can make the difference between someone being allowed to remain safely in the United States with their family or face permanent family separation by deportation 
going to potentially dangerous conditions. All people deserve due process regardless of who they are, where they were born, or what they have experienced, and I urge you to oppose this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'd like to invite five additional speakers that are in opposition. Crystal Irving, Nate Wollman, Lindsay Toklowski, Paulina Reyes, and Patricia Mondragon. Good afternoon. My name is Erin Sirimoto Grassi. I'm the Policy Director at Alliance San Diego. I'm also a District 2 resident where I have resided for eight years as a homeowner. Alliance San Diego strongly opposes Supervisor Anderson's letter to end funding to the Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program. And quite honestly, as a District 2 resident, I am ashamed that it is my supervisor bringing this forward in the first place. The Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program is an important resource to the San Diego community members who are faced with deportation. Being able to have legal representation to navigate the court system leads to better outcomes, which impacts not just the individual facing deportation, but also their family and the community. Access to legal representation is a universal human right. And I will remind folks that human rights are inherent. We are born with them. They are not dependent on whether or not you have a criminal history or whether or not you have a high or a low chance of winning your case. Legal representation ensures that we are guaranteeing that we are protecting human dignity during the entire process. We urge the county to continue protecting the human rights of everyone, including individuals um, who are facing deportation. And we ask you to protect the right to legal representation and oppose Supervisor Anderson's letter. Next speaker, please. Michael, I'm for this. And I actually wish I could <laughs> read Truth's speech again because it was excellent. She made so many excellent points. Um, but one thing about this agenda item is it makes absolutely no sense when it comes to the equity impact statement for this item. It says, this board action promotes the county's values and principles of equity through a focus on underserved communities. I don't get how this applies to this. And then it's sustainability impact statement. This board action aligns with the County of San Diego's sustainability goal to provide just and equitable access to county services and to focus investment in chronically underserved communities. Now, I'm speaking specifically to this agenda item 11, but I also know that these equity impact statements and sustainability impact statements often make no sense, and it definitely makes no sense in the terms of the way this agenda item is written. But anyway, I'm for this one, thanks. Okay, Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Chair Vargas and Supervisors. My name is Nate Wallman, and I'm Vice President of SIU Local 221 and a resident of District 3. I want to add the voice of our membership in opposing this item. Our region is stronger when we ensure due process for all people. Uh, San Diego County must continue to fund and prioritize this work of the Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program because access to counsel is a civil right that should be afforded to everyone. And let's be honest, uh, any court in which individuals involved are either not aware of or cannot fully avail of themselves of their rights is not a court that can serve any true justice. Being convicted of anything doesn't change that. And crimes are already taken into account when deciding immigration cases. Worse, this proposed action would disproportionately affect black and brown immigrants who are structurally less likely to be able to receive adequate representation in an immigration hearing. It's inequitable. Furthermore, it is in all taxpayers' best interest to ensure that justice be served with equity and that their transition into our society is just and productive. We urge the board to reject this proposal and get back to the important work of the county, which includes a commitment to due process and building stronger communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. Patricia Bondragon, Patricia Mondragon, Regional Policy Manager for Alliance San Diego. We are members of the San Diego Immigrant Rights Consortium. I'm also a D4 resident. Um, 
We have been strongly in support of a universal legal defense program for immigrants that are in removal proceedings. Um, and we would like to see it continue to be con truly universal. I urge the Board of Supervisors to vote no on item 11. Not only is the immigration court system complicated, by our, but our entire immigration process is broken. Immigration attorneys have to keep on top of the ever-changing rules that act as a band-aid to a dysfunctional process. How then can we expect non-citizens who often do not speak English and are new to our government system to represent themselves effectively? Access to legal counsel is a fundamental human right and a cornerstone of our justice system. All people deserve due process regardless of who they are, where they were born, or what they have experienced. Rather than restricting the program, we should be discussing expanding this important program and making it truly universal. San Diego County's Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program makes our immigration court system more just and more humane by ensuring that all immigrants in our community have access to basic due process. I urge you to vote no today on, Anderson, on, on Supervisor Anderson's board letter. Thank you. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'd like to invite five additional speakers in opposition. Angelina Corsani, Mackenzie Martinez, Lauren Cusatello, Robert Zapeta, and Flower Alvarez Lopez. If I've called your name, please come forward. Thank you. My name is Paulina Reyes. I'm the managing attorney with Immigrant Defenders Law Center, and I am also the chair of the San Diego Immigrant Rights Consortium, a coalition of over 50 faith-based, labor-based, and community organizations which has supported this program. IMDEF represents detained and non-detained individuals facing deportation in Southern California. We proudly began serving the San Diego community in 2019. Our office is currently located in District 1. We believe that no immigrant should stand alone when facing deportation from the United States, which can tear someone apart from their family, loved ones, and the only place that they've known as home. The Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program is a critical resource to San Diego residents and their families, many of whom may be U.S. citizens. As part of the program, we have assisted individuals detained at Otay Mesa Detention Center, a privately run facility housing, um, detaining over 1,000 people for months or even years at a time. When we visit and speak to our detained clients, we often hear the desperate need for an attorney. Many of these individuals have lived in San Diego for most of their lives. They have jobs in the community, families, friends, and people who support them. We have also represented individuals seeking asylum whose lives would be at risk of harm or death if deported from the United States. All individuals deserve the right to due process regardless of who they are, where they were born, or what they have experienced. Immigrants that completed their criminal sentences should not face double punishment in our immigration system by being denied access to counsel. Justice means access to counsel for all. I urge you to vote no on this agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, um, my name is Angelina Corasani, and I'm here today on behalf of the Center on Policy Initiatives and the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition. And I'm here today to urge the Board of Supervisors to vote against this agenda item. The Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program is a critical first of its kind program that provides access to due process by ensuring legal representation to individuals facing deportation. Access to due process, which is essentially the legal equivalent of a fair chance, is a foundational principle of our judicial system. However, most people detained in California go without legal representation. This places people at a huge disadvantage when they're trying to overcome language barriers, dealing with being separated from their families, and all while navigating the complex immigration court system. But data shows that immigrants with access to counsel succeed more than five times as often as their unrepresented counterparts. So by, pro so by providing access to legal representation, this county program has ensured that people detained in our local facilities have what any person deserves, a fair chance. The recommendations proposed by Supervisor Anderson in this item would set a dangerous precedent um, and feed into an inflammatory narrative that this board should be very wary of. In the American legal system, all individuals are entitled to a fair chance, regardless of their background or history. I strongly urge you all to vote against this item. 
uphold the fundamental constitutional principle of due process for all and continue to support this program that makes our flawed immigration court system more humane. Thank you for your time. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'd like to invite the remaining speakers in opposition, Lillian Serrano, Monica Langarica, Eitan Paled, and Esmeralda Flores. If I've called your name, please come forward. Good afternoon to the board. My name is Lauren Cusatello. I'm director of the ABA Immigration Justice Project, but I speak in my individual capacity as a resident of District 4 and as an immigration lawyer. As, as some of my colleagues in the community have already voiced, the Supreme Court said 60 years ago that a fair trial requires in an adversarial system that counsel be appointed for someone who cannot afford to hire a lawyer for themselves. And what we mean when we say a fair trial is a trial at which a lawyer presents all defenses and claims that a person is legally entitled to present. And the, the difference that we've seen in, in working with non-citizens in this legal system is tremendous. When we talk about removing that right, removing that fairness based on someone's alleged history, uh, we, we run into the challenge that we are depriving those folks of, of the rights that, that Congress has entitled them to present. Uh, and and I, I think it is important for this board to consider that people with truly serious criminal crimes are eligible for very little relief in the immigration system and what little relief they're eligible for would be unknown to them without counsel. But the people who are eligible relief fall into two main categories. People who have been victims of crime or human trafficking and have assisted law enforcement, and people who would be tortured if they were removed to their countries of origin. If anybody deserves a fair trial, it's, it's these folks, the, these folks who would be disregarded by a system in which they were not informed of their rights, not informed of the possibility for protection after already having suffered torture or crime in this country or abroad. It's also worth noting that there is, I'll thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Chair Vargas and Supervisors. My name is Monica Langarica. I am a senior staff attorney at the Center for Immigration Law and Policy at UCLA Law and a lifelong resident of San Diego County and a current resident of District 4. I urge you to vote no on Supervisor Anderson's letter. As a former direct representation attorney for people facing deportation while detained at the Otay Mesa Detention Center, and as a current federal court impact litigator, I know that lawyers are critical to ensure that people have in the immigration system can access rights they are already entitled to under current federal immigration laws. I also know that the Department of Homeland Security, which acts as the prosecutor in immigration court cases, routinely makes mistakes, and this is especially true in complex cases involving past criminal convictions. And I know that the Department of, of Homeland Security severely oversteps its authority, also on a routine basis. Lawyers are a basic and a critical component of, a legal, of the legal process for all people and they provide a critical check on government and on an agency whose mission it is to deport our community members. San Diego County, including the Board of Supervisors and communities throughout this region, already recognized this when they allocated funding for the Immigrants' Rights Legal Defense Program over two years ago. An attack, any attack, including this one, on this program is an attack on due process and other fundamental values that are enshrined in our Constitution. I urge you to vote no on item 11. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Chair Vargas and uh, supervisors. My name is Esmeralda Flores. I'm the Southern Region Policy Manager for CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights. I am here today to express our opposition to this item and our continued support for the Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program. In May of 2021, this Board of Supervisors approved this program to provide immigrants facing deportation access to legal representation, the first throughout the entire southern border. Thank you, Vice Chair Lawson-Rimmer, for leading the effort. 
by providing legal representation to anyone who cannot afford a, a lawyer, regardless of their immigration status or background, we protect our widely shared values of due process, fairness, and justice for all. A value already exemplified by public defenders all over the nation. In the face of unjust, xenophobic, and harsh border and immigration policies, this board acted to protect our immigrant community. These fundamental legal protections should not go away just because some of our leaders' bias and lack of understanding of the complexity of the immigration system and its harmful consequences. These ignorant attacks and skateboarding against immigrants must stop. We know this program is already changing lives and protecting families in our community. I urge you, I urge you to, vote ple to please vote no and vote against ignorance today and to defend our values and fundamental right to legal representation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'll do a final call for the speakers in person. Mackenzie Martinez, Robert Zapeda, Flower Alvarez Lopez, Crystal Irving, Lindsay Toklowski, Lillian Serrano, and Aton Pellad. If I've called your name, please come forward. Not seeing any movement in the chamber, we'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you'll hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'll remind the callers they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll start with our first caller. Good afternoon, my name is Kate Clark. I'm the Senior Director of Immigration Services of Jewish Family Service of San Diego. GFS is a core partner of the San Diego Rapid Response Network. Importantly, in 2017, the San Diego Rapid Response Network was founded under the last administration to support individuals who are experiencing immigration legal emergencies and needed immediate access to counsel. Outside its work with SDRN, GFS has a team of more than 40 staff who provide legal representation to non-citizens in detained and non-detained settings and non-citizens that are released on the Alternatives to Detention ICE program who are coming through our migrant shelter, some of which are supported through the County of San Diego Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program. I urge you to vote no on Supervisor Anderson's board item. The Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program is critical to providing access to counsel to help navigate the complex area of immigration law and ensuring non-citizens due process rights are upheld. We know this program is helping reunite families and protect lives. For these reasons, JFS urges this board to deny the request made on item 11. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Markovitz, and I am a resident of District 4. I am here to urge the Board of Supervisors to vote no on this mean-spirited agenda item. Due process does not exist when people don't have access to lawyers. People who don't have legal training cannot get a fair hearing in any part of the legal system. They are inevitably overwhelmed. No one should face a hearing that has potentially life-threatening consequences without access to counsel. This county is taking an, has taken an inspiring step by providing a service that the federal and state governments have failed to provide and filling a crucial gap. It has created a measure of humanity and dignity where there was none by ensuring that all immigrants in our community have access to basic due process and compressed legal processes that can have life or death consequences. We know that due process and access to counsel matter in immigration court. Immigrants with counsel succeed more than five times as often as unrepresented immigrants. This is clear evidence that the system just does not work when people do not have lawyers. People should not face deportation without a fair process, and there is no fair process without counsel. People should not be sent to face potentially deadly circumstances because they don't have a lawyer. Families should not be torn apart because of lack of access Council. The county has recognized this in the past and has taken important steps to ensure that people are treated fairly and given the process they are due. This measure is a huge step in the opposite direction. I urge this board not to take that step. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Christy Lovehill, good morning, Chair Vargas and Supervisors. My name is Christy Lovehill. I'm the Advocacy and Legal Director at the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial County. We are here to strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to vote no on the board letter introduced by Supervisor Anderson. Access to legal counsel is a cornerstone of our justice system. All people deserve due process, 
regardless of who they are, where they were born, or what they have experienced. However, under U.S. immigration policy, people seeking asylum or facing deportation are not provided court-appointed counsel. This is fundamentally unjust. The groundbreaking San Diego County Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program closes the justice gap in the federal immigration court system. For immigrants detained at the Otay Mesa Detention Center, the, the IRLDP is vital to ensuring due process and a more just system. Statewide data, as you've heard, shows that detained immigrants who have counsel in immigration court succeed more than five times as often as their unrepresented counterparts. When a loved one is detained or deported, it impacts their entire family and the San Diego County community at large. For people facing deportation, legal representation can be a critical line of defense in keeping families and communities together. We urge this board to vote no on the board letter. By voting no, San Diego County will allow people to make informed decisions about their cases, access the rights they have under U.S. law, and most importantly, help ensure that immigrant families and communities in our county have a fair opportunity to stay together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now here from the next caller. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Ian Ceruelo. I am a member of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance and a resident of District 2. I am here to register my strong rejection of, of this uh, um, proposal. The right to due process and legal representation should be afforded to everyone. What is at stake in deportation proceedings are the lives and future of our friends, our neighbors, our fellow human being, the future of our neighbor's children, many of them U.S. citizens as well. Being able to access legal representation could mean life and death for many people. It could mean the breakup of families, the lifelong trauma and injury, especially to children and young people. I know this because I am a practicing immigration attorney here in San Diego, defending immigrants from deportation and assisting them in their application for immigration relief. Lastly, I want to say that those who argue that taxpayers' money should not be spent for undocumented people, especially for those who have certain criminal convictions, I say that they are assuming they, they, they have the wrong assumption that undocumented, that undocumented people are not taxpayers. Most of these people have lived and worked in San Diego for a long time, and they pay taxes, they declare their income. So they deserve, just like any one of us, they deserve to be treated equally, and they deserve the right uh, to, to, to exercise the right to due process and legal representation. I urge this bo uh, a board to vote no to this ill-advised proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the final caller. Man, propaganda is flying around like the mosquitoes that Bill Gates makes. Um, so, you know, it's just sad because this is going to not pass uh, because Nora and Tara have their agenda. And, you know, even if Jim was here, it wouldn't matter because Nora has the final say. Um, and this would go against what you guys are wanting to do. Um, but this really is sad because all of these things get muddied together. Like we have an invasion happening on, on our land right now. And there are people that are coming over that aren't seeking asylum. As I had mentioned before, there are military aged men that are coming here, not seeking asylum. I guarantee you that. And there also have men bringing children that they know nothing about. So that's not a family that you're breaking up. That's actually trafficking that you're watching happen before your eyes. And we're sitting here paying money for trafficking, people who traffic drugs and humans, murder, rape, um, engage in domestic violence and child abuse, money laundering, all of this stuff. And we're supposed to believe that um, even if they just came, that they've been paying taxes and so that they should have this. There are people suffering. We're spending $5 million annually funding this. And the people in the United States or in this county can't even get help for things that they need. But we're saying, yeah, let's just make these criminals make sure that they can stay, right? It's a very muddied, watered thing. And as long as we pull on the heartstrings of all of these people, because it's sad, you're like, we welcome refugees and immigrants and protecting them from crime in communities because they're at a greater risk. That's not necessarily true. The people that live here 
could be at greater risk because, as you see, they engage in all of these crimes that we're sitting here and trying to protect them and make sure that they don't get deported. I've had friends who came here legally and were fighting to get representation and never saw it because it's going to these criminals and people that it shouldn't be going to instead of the people that have done their due diligence and duty to come here in a legal manner. Thank you. For the record, that speaker was Audra. Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I'm glad we let, let the uh, public speak because uh, no one's speaking to my board letter. My board letter isn't trying to redo the vote uh, on whether we should have the IRLDP, Immigrant Rights Legal Defense Program. That's not what this vote's about. That vote went with a 3-2 vote a year ago, and uh, we're not revisiting that. The county decided to go in that direction, and I get that. But what we are trying to discern is whether we should be taking dollars to defend people from immigration, not criminal. This is civil. Immigration court civil, not criminal. So when you say you have a right to defense, not in civil, your buddy next door sues you, you don't have a right to defense. The reason why the federal government doesn't necessarily offer them because they don't have a right to it. Now, I've been doing this a long time. I've been in a lot of hearings in the state legislature. And I've seen how asylum seekers and uh, uh, refugees have gone through. There are those criminal elements that prey on them prey on their community because they're not, they know they're not going to go to the police, prey on them because they're easy marks. And now we have a system that we've identified 34 people that have convicted felonies. Now, I'm not saying that all of those convicted felonies are of the magnitude, but we know federal law prohibits them from becoming U.S. citizens. So the question then becomes, do we defend those who prey on asylum seekers to allow them to stay longer in our country when they have no chance at citizenship? Or do we turn around and say that quarter million dollars that we're spending, up to quarter million dollars to defend them on an immigration, not criminal, because they've already been convicted of crime. And by the way, if they were here and they were accused of a crime, they would absolutely have a right to a public defender. So the notion of mixing the two is confusing to everybody, but they're completely different. And when we look at this, what are the, who are the people we're talking about? Well, they have, it, uh, they have different listings, so it's hard to track, but you have aggravated felony convictions. That could be a murderer, it could be a rapist, it could be somebody trafficking children, it could be somebody who's trafficking fentanyl. Now, earlier today, we had to vote for $3 million to help asylum seekers. I'm old enough to remember that I seconded that motion because I'm such a hateful person. There is a difference between drawing distinctions between people who are trying to improve their lives and people who prey on those same folks. And I don't believe that it's right that we struggle to find county funding to help asylum seekers who are crossing the border, coming here for a better life by, by paying to defend from, de, uh, from being deported the very criminals who prey on them. And that's the distinction. And what we're really talking about is fewer than 30 people. So when we talk about this huge deal about how the whole system is falling apart, you may think that in your personal truth, that's not what I'm proposing. And uh, I want you to think about three things when I turn to my colleagues. One is the safety of the people coming to our country. And when we reward those who pray on them, we're sending the wrong signal. And we especially see it in my district when you talk to asylum seekers, because they truly are persecuted. It's not economic. They're being beheaded. Their kids are, are being taken captive. It's horrible. The things that they've lived through and gone through are absolutely horrible. So there's no way in good faith I can say those who would murder, rape, put your children in through trafficking, I'm going to help assist become U.S. citizens when 
by law, they have no right to citizenship, and we're helping them violate federal provisions. So this simply would be, once it's be re been revealed through a background check that they have these felonies that prohibit them from becoming U.S. citizens, we cease and desist giving them aid, and we turn around and flip that aid to all the new asylum seekers who need our help, who are here for the right reasons and aren't praying on others. The second thing is we have limited resources, and I know we say that all the time, but everybody that's gotten up here and spoken today has asked for more money, it's not enough, nothing's ever enough, and the need continues to grow. I have the second poorest district, and I know that Nora has the poorest, and I think of all the things that they need and what they want and what's necessary for them, and there has to be a balance because there is a cap, and yet, you know, we want to help the homeless. We want to increase our bandwidth for mental health. I voted $3 million to help asylum seekers. We've got to be thoughtful in our approach, and we have to draw definite lines. All I'm asking today is that we had guidelines that stop us from wasting money on people who prey on others, who have been found guilty, and who have no chance under federal law of becoming U.S. citizens, and that we're not using our legal defense to, to defy the Biden administration's rules on immigration. The second thing is, um, I already talked about the limited resources and how we have to make sure. We talked about earlier, uh, Tara has a great plan on homelessness that all costs money that all is necessary and it impacts our quality of life. The reason why people come here is for a better life, and yet we're helping the people that prey on them live next door to them, and I think that's wrong. And then the last is, this is very narrow. We're not talking about the over 800 people we helped in the last year. I'm, it's fantastic we were able to help 800. And I believe, and I don't know this for a fact, that we're the only county in the nation that provides legal defense for those who are crossing the border. So uh, with that in mind, I get that not everybody agrees with me, but in the legislature we always had a courtesy motion. We always had a courtesy motion to allow things to be heard and a vote to occur. And whether my colleagues agree with me or not, I would ask that somebody would give me a courtesy motion because uh, stifling my opportunity to a vote, uh, it would be more punishing than allowing a murderer to try to get around federal law. So with that, I, I close and ask for a courtesy motion. Oh, I'm, I move it. I'm asking for a courtesy second. Okay, so you're making a motion. Supervisor? Yeah, I did. Okay. Thank you. So I'm asking for a second. All right. Is there a second? Chairwoman Vargas, that motion fails for lack of a second. All right. The next item on the agenda is item 13. We'll now move on to discuss item 13. It, we're going to receive and approve uh, the updated LPOE settlement framework. Direct report back on significance updates to the opioid settlement framework and authorize one staff year for toxicology services to expand surveillance of emerging drug trends. I'm going to hand over the floor to the county team for a presentation. It's about, is it a 15 minute presentation? 10 minute presentation? It's about, about 15 minutes, ma'am. Hopefully not longer. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to take a five minute break because, um, if any one of us steps out, um, we lose quorum. So I just need a five minute break and then we'll come back, okay? So I'm gonna give you time to Sounds bring great. everybody out and then we're gonna take five minute break and we'll come back.
Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Vargas. <laughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> Chairwoman Vargas and members of the board. In October last year, your board unanimously approved a comprehensive opioid settlement framework, leveraging unprecedented awards from lawsuits against many opioid pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers, and distributors. These awards, in addition to other county funding streams, have already helped advance the county's overdose prevention, healthcare integration, and harm reduction efforts. We will update you today on some of those efforts. Since the adoption of the framework, further information has been received on upcoming opioid settlement agreements, and additional state guidelines have been released on the utilization of opioid settlement funds. Your board provided direction to staff in May to evaluate our framework's alignment with current funding guidance and to return with any necessary changes. So today, in alignment with the most recent guidance, we are seeking authorization from your board for an updated framework that includes three key features. First, adding a staff position to the county medical examiner's office. Second, increasing funds for treatment and recovery services for individuals within or transitioning out of the county's correctional facilities. Third, and most significantly, reducing pr the previously approved allocation for prescription medication disposal bags from $8 million to a half a million dollars. This last change will allow us to reallocate those funds to allowable programs that maximize our impact on people with substance use disorders. There are two recommended options for this reallocation that will be laid out in the presentation. We are projected to sustain the already approved programs under the framework for several years under either option. We will continue to assess, uh, reassess activities within the framework to ensure that they are still responsive to community needs, stakeholder feedback, and current uh, compliance guidelines. We will begin with updates on several activities within the three components of the approved framework. Harm reduction and prevention includes interventions that meet people where they are to prevent overdoses, disease transmission, and improve well-being. Under healthcare integration, we focus on initiatives to improve access to care, minimize stigma, lower costs, and improve health outcomes. Social supports and services include emotional and social supports and workforce integration, which have previously, uh, which, have, which have been seamlessly integrated within activities across both healthcare integration and harm reduction and prevention. While the board letter details the updates on all the activities underway within the framework as shown here, we'll be using this time to emphasize a few notable priorities such as primary prevention, our public health messaging campaign, overdose surveillance and response program, drug tracking services, emergency medical services or EMS, buprenorphine pilot program, treatment for incarcerated individuals from the sheriff's department, and prescription medication disposal bags. I'm joined this morning, or this afternoon, sorry, by uh, Dr. Luke Bergman, uh, Director of Public Health, uh, of Behavioral Health Services, Dr. Wilma Wooten, Public Health Officer, Holly Porter, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for the Public Safety Group, Teresa, Teresa adams Hyder, Assistant Sheriff, and uh, Amy Thompson, Executive Finance Director for the agency. I'd like to thank them all, as well as the County Medical Examiner's Office and Emergency Medical Services for their great partnerships on this effort. I will now turn it over to Dr. Bergman. Thanks, Eric. Within the harm reduction and prevention domain, a key program investment will be Project Alert, an evidence-based program designed to educate youth to build resilience, awareness, safer choices, and refusal skills. The program is already integrated into the regular school curriculum for seventh and eighth grades within designated schools through a contract with the San Diego County Office of Education and will be adapted to include sixth graders as well. Currently, 24 schools across the county are committed to implementing the 11 core lessons of Project Alert in at least sixth, seventh, and eighth grade during the 23-24 school year. In alignment with the framework, we've continued our public outreach and education to promote awareness of the harms related to opioid misuse, overdose prevention, and available community resources. Opioid settlement funds supported the second phase of the county's youth and parent illicit fentanyl awareness campaign to further enhance and reinforce prevention efforts. Outreach platforms included social media, streaming audio, printed school banners and posters, and billboards. In partnership with Public Health Services, settlement funds were also being used to continue a general public naloxone campaign that was originally launched by Overdose Data to Action Funds. 
A new campaign focusing on harm reduction awareness for higher risk populations is estimated to come online later this winter. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Wootman. Thank you, Dr. Bergman. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Bergman. The overall, or rather the overdose surveillance and response program is a cross-departmental partnership led by public health services and behavioral health services. The program aims to monitor and improve the timely detection of overdose cases and potential outbreaks and coordinate more effective responses to our communities during overdose surges. Additionally, the framework includes monitoring for emerging drug trends through drug checking, which will be a collaboration between public health services and the county's public safety group. On this slide are two programs under the approved framework. The first program is drug checking, which focuses on drug surveillance and data collection efforts. Through drug checking services and technology, drug samples brought in by people at higher risk of an overdose can be tested and help individuals better understand what is there, what is in their substances by providing information on the chemical composition, such as whether there is fentanyl in the sample and how much. Plans to reach targeted high-risk populations, such as those from rural communities and communities of color, are also underway. The second program is drug testing of suspected overdose cases and unknown seized substances, pills, syringes, and associated paraphernalia processed by the medical examiner's office. Through this body of work, we anticipate obtaining more robust data on emerging drug trends, clusters, and use evolutions, which will help inform and expedite the county's response to the communities impacted. Now welcome Holly Porter from the Public Safety Group to provide further details. Thank you, Dr. Wooten. The medical examiner investigates all deaths suspected to be from drug overdoses countywide. Drugs detected in people who die from an overdose can be the first clue to emerging drug trends. Also, as Dr. Wooten mentioned earlier, in collaboration with the crime lab, we will conduct surveillance, testing of drugs collected from death scenes. The, addition, the additional staff person in the medical examiner's office will ensure this work occurs and will assist in being proactive in the ever-evolving drug la landscape. This collaborative work with the medical examiner's office, public health, and the sheriff's department will support the timely identification and analysis of emerging drug trends, which is crucial to informing public health measures and law enforcement efforts. To better treat opioid users and bridge the gap to much needed resources, County Emergency Medical Services, otherwise known as EMS, launched a pilot program authorizing paramedics in the field to utilize bu buprenorphine to treat patients in opioid withdrawal. Paramedics often make contact with individuals that have either suffered an overdose or are experiencing significant withdrawal symptoms. Buprenorphine alleviates the withdrawal symptoms and prevents the opioid high, increasing the chance they'll be willing to seek help. EMS is working with behavioral health services and others to ensure that patients have a path to treatment and other services. The pilot program has started in parts of County Service Area 17 and Escondido and soon within the County Fire Protection District. This is part of an overall opioid crisis mitigation strategy that includes the Leave Behind Naloxone program and data collection for OD maps and related initiatives. I'll now turn the presentation over to Assistant Sheriff Adam Snyder. Thank you, Holly. As previously mentioned, treatment of incarcerated individuals is a key component of healthcare integration. The Sheriff's Department has been providing some form of substance use disorder treatment and programming to our incarcerated population since before the pandemic. Since 2019, the Sheriff's Department has provided medication to individuals who were previously identified as being enrolled in a community substance use disorder program. This first phase of medication assisted treatment or MAT focused on providing continuity of care to individuals as they transition from the community to incarceration. In January of 2023, we established our first designated MAT housing unit at Vista Detention Facility, which focused on cohorting individuals for the purpose of medication disbursement and individualized and group counseling. 
The Sheriff's Department launched the second phase of MAT in July of 2023, which focused on patients identified during intake as recently being on an opioid. For this initiation phase, a patient is assessed at intake by health staff using the Clinical Opiate Withdrawal Scale, or COWS, to evaluate symptoms for the safe initiation and continued maintenance of medications. After dose stabilization, the patients are offered to participate in continued counseling and therapy associated with MAT. Phase two MAT is provided to both individualized individuals in formalized MAT housing, as well as hundreds of other incarcerated persons in our larger facilities. We will be moving into phase three, which is self-referral in the near future. The third phase of MAT will most likely increase the number of individuals in need of medication and substance use disorder counseling. Providing MAT services, including programming and counseling to all incarcerated individuals outside of dedicated housing is challenging. For safety reasons, we cannot program individuals of unlike classification levels together. The Sheriff's Department recognizes the need to provide consistent substance use disorder programming and mental health counseling to persons regardless of their classification level. In order to maintain a safe environment for the incarcerated person and staff, MAT cohorts must be conducted more often and include incarcerated individuals of all classification levels. The Sheriff's Department plans on starting six cohorts a year with 10 to 12 individuals per cohort in six of our seven facilities. This equates to services being provided to more than 400 incarcerated persons annually. One-on-one -on -one service will be provided to individuals who require SUD intervention, have unique reentry needs, or require additional or enhanced security needs due to charges, behavioral concerns, or mental health or mental concerns. These figures are estimated at about five to 700 a year. These estimates are based on current experience with our psychosocial and contracts in anticipation of increased MAT participation. Increased programming means we could conduct in-reach for almost 1,100 incarcerated persons each year. The requested funds from the framework will help the Sheriff's Department cover these additional progr programming and staff costs to provide increased evidence-based treatment and recovery support, including MAT, for persons with substance use disorders within and tra transitioning out of the criminal justice system. This $500,000 funding will be included in both recommendation number one, option A, recommendation number two, option B, which you will hear about later in the presentation. I will now turn the pr presentation back to Dr. McDonald. Thank you, Assistant Sheriff. To prevent overdose and prescription drug misuse, we will provide prescription medication disposal bags to people most at risk for having unused opioid prescriptions. This includes giving them to people who have recently been prescribed opioids for pain relief after medical or dental procedures, which aligns with evidence supporting the use of these disposal bags. The bags allow people to inactivate unused drugs and safely dispose of them in the trash. Today we are recommending an update from the previously approved framework to reduce the size of the prescription medication disposal bags pilot program. The new pilot is envisioned to start with a focus on patient prescribed opioids for pain relief after a procedure in the central and east regions, which are the communities that have been hardest hit by the opioid epidemic. The pilot includes partnering with hospitals, medical and dental providers, and pharmacies in the identified regions for distribution of the disposal bags. Outcomes of the pilot will be included in future framework updates once it has concluded. To recap, a review of the framework approved by your board last year was conducted to prioritize evidence-based activities that meet state guidelines, that support, expand, or enhance current county opioid abatement efforts, and are not otherwise supported by other funds. The review provided an opportunity to restructure the framework in accordance with the state's defined core strategies highlight activities included in the current budget plan and prioritize new activities. Key updates include, as previously discussed, one staff year for the medical examiner to enhance toxicology testing and screening, funding for the sheriff department to provide medically assisted treatment for individuals transitioning out of county jails, and a reduction in funding of, for prescription medication disposal bags. The continued operational funding uh, for prioritized frame, framework programs is projected to be in place through fiscal year 28 to 29 or longer, depending on the option your board selects today. Today's recommendation includes your receipt and approval of the updated opioid settlement framework by approving one of two options. Both options include the three updates from the prior slide and would include all the activities in the prioritized spending plan. Option A 
reduces the previously approved $8 million for the prescription medication disposal bags to half a million and reinvests the funds to support continuity of approved services as outlined in attachment A of the board letter through fiscal years uh, 2030 through 2031. Option B includes the same reduction of prescription medication disposal bags, but has a two-year shorter duration of program funding than option A, supporting current programs until fiscal year 28-29. This reduced frame, frame time frame in option B allows investment of seven and a half million in one-time funds for construction of the East County Recovery Bridge Center, or RBC. The RBC was previously approved by your board as part of the capital improvement needs assessment process and was projected to be partially covered by grant funding that did not materialize. The RBC will provide a supervised safe environment for those who are publicly intoxicated, primarily from alcohol or methamphetamine use, and will include screening and connection to care for other substance use disorders, including opioid use disorder. Outpatient substance use disorder services will also be available to ensure continuity of care. The state guidance around opioid settlement funds allows for infrastructure investments for new or expanded substance use disorder treatment infrastructure. The East County RBC represents an opportunity to leverage opioid settlement funds to fill a gap in funding. Health and Human Services Agency will continue to pursue infrastructure grant opportunities to support the Recovery Bridge Center. I'd like to turn it over now to Amy Thompson, who will now provide additional information on some cash flow projections. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. For illustration purposes, on the screen is the cash flow projection under option A and option B, displayed through fiscal year 3132 when a gap is first projected under option A. Revenue projections are estimated using distributions for the two ongoing settlements finalized to date, Janssen and Distributor, which are estimated at roughly 6.1 million combined annually through fiscal year 2029-30 when the Janssen settlement payments are scheduled to end. Additionally, it is the county's understanding that settlements for Teva, Allergan, Walmart, Walgreens, and CVS are being finalized and it is expected the first annual payments will be received in the last quarter of 2023 or first quarter of 2024. Final county amounts and timing are not yet known. Assumptions were made based on the size of the nationwide settlement amounts to calculate estimates of 3.2 million per year for the county for planning purposes. This brings the total to a little over 9 million a year for the next several years as shown on the very first row of the table on the slide. Amounts for various other settlements in the pipeline are not yet included, but will be monitored and costs adjusted accordingly as needed to meet available revenues and priorities with the recognition that these are one-time funds over a finite number of years. Under both scenarios, there is a balance of 12.7 million remaining in settlement funds received last fiscal year that is being used to help support ongoing operations in the out years. All ongoing operating costs are the same under both options. The only difference, as described in the prior slides, is that option B also includes an additional upfront investment of 7.5 million to support the East County Recovery Bridge Center bringing the projected spend to 16.2 million bolded on the slide in fiscal year 23-24 for option B compared to 8.7 million under option A. You'll see in the slide in red over to the right that this additional upfront investment pushed the anticipated gap for ongoing operating costs up to fiscal year 29-30 from fiscal year 31-32 under option A. Uh, it is important to note that under either option, to promote sustainability of programs implemented where possible, the Health and Human Services Agency and the county's public safety group will explore additional Medi-Cal billing opportunities, as well as grant and federal and state allocations should they become available. I'll now turn it back over to Dr. McDonald to summarize the recommendations in closing. Uh, thank you, Amy, and in fact, uh, thanks to all of our presenters uh, this afternoon. Uh, today's actions request that you receive and approve the updated opioid settlement framework by approving either option A or option B. We also request authority to report back on any significant updates 
and add one staff year under the medical examiner's offices, office. I thank you, and our team is ready to accept any questions. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open up for uh, public comment first, and then we're gonna go ahead and connect with my colleagues. Thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. We have eight requests to speak on this item, six in person and two requesting to speak by phone. Also note for the record that we received two e-comments, one in favor and one in opposition. Any members of the public that requested to speak on item 13 by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, starting with those in favor of this item. As their name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'd like to invite forward Tara Stamos Busig and Jason Sun to be. And they'll be followed by the speakers in opposition, Mark, Truth, Hermes, and Paul the Bold. I've called your name, please come forward. You'll have two minutes to address the board and I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Vargas and Supervisors. My name is Jason Sunby and I'm the president and CEO of the company that manufactures the, the uh, drug at home disposal product that we were talking about, uh, Deterra. Um, it's an evidence-based at-home drug deactivation and disposal technology, uh, and it's a primary prevention tool. I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to the board uh, of supervisors uh, for your commitment and proposed partnership with the Terra and our shared goal of preventing drug abuse, misuse, and diversion within your county. This collaboration not only demonstrates a proactive stance towards a safer and healthier San Diego County, but also sets a precedent for the other regions to follow. Thank you for leading the way and your dedication for the well-being of your community, and we look forward to the positive impact this partnership will undoubtedly create in the expansion of this pilot project to include, include all San Diegans. Uh, I'm here uh, to answer any questions you may have today or in the future, and thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Ms. Truth, and I'm just in awe of the robust cash flow from frivolous lawsuits against opi opioid makers, when really Janssen's owner, Johnson & Johnson, should have been sued for clot shut injuries and deaths instead. In response to the so-called regional overdose crisis, the county has offered comprehensive harm reintroduction for addicts to never get clean. They've also copied the failed D.A.R.E. program with an anti-fentanyl propaganda campaign for children. And now another propaganda campaign against opioids. It's just say no to the real education. Billboards and posters, but has anything gotten better? No. All I'm seeing is, and hearing is an over $19 million framework for failure. And the reason for this is because the opioid settlement agreements have guidelines, NORA guidelines, set by the California Department of Healthcare Services. Nothing about local needs and local people's input about what's worked and what hasn't worked. The propaganda campaigns are the most useless of all the state dictated county programs. Everyone can see what these drugs are doing to people. They're making them zombies on the streets. Substance abuse treatment centers are obviously what's needed. Regarding recommendation number three, we don't need drug trends surveyed for another year, costing an undisclosed amount for another county worker. Recommendation A, it's $500,000 for drug disposal bags down from $8 million. What a cut. I actually like that one. For individuals prescribed opioids after a medical procedure. But my question is, how do you guys know who that is? Is there tracking going on at hospitals? Are they reporting to here? And recommendation B is $7.5 million for the East County Recovery Bridge Center. It sounds great, but if there's harm re reintroduction to service going on and it's connected to Bergman's billion dollar prison day spas, absolutely no to that. They locked facility. It feels like a day spa, like places I used to spend hundreds of dollars to send my wife. That's crazy. Next speaker, please. Mark, well, um, first of all, the uh, Naxalone uh, stands, I think there's seven of them somewhere here downtown. 
Uh, I think I looked at a map of where they were once. I can't remember. Nobody I know knows where they are. There's only seven of them. Uh, I suppose if you had a child that did drugs, you might keep one on you, uh, concerned for your child or, or their friends. But the chances that you'll be near one or have any idea where it is are pretty much nil when something happens. Somebody could be half a block away. They wouldn't even know. The person would probably die right in front of them. Um, and uh, now to some it might appear that the supervisors are retarded, but I don't think you are. Um, of course, it's obvious to everybody that opioids are coming from South America. And if you don't close the border, I mean, good luck. You know, it's the, also, as far as education goes, I do think it's good to tell kids about uh, how dangerous fentanyl is, very deadly. However, any but parent that's got a kid knows telling a kid not to do something uh, is, it's, they just make a beeline for it. It becomes the most popular thing with all their friends to do is what you don't want them to do. Um, people need to see why the borders are open and why this problem is so bad. Uh, this Rosa Corey video, it's a YouTube title. Um, and if you see it from three minutes and 30 seconds, you can see that, oh, excuse me, this is the Rosa Corey video. Three minutes and 30 seconds to 24, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> well, the end of the video. And s see this one about why the borders are open, creating the North American Union. That's um, related to number 13? Yeah, um, oh. so, yes, 13. So literally, this is why it's happening. Next speaker, please. Um, it's a poll of bold. Uh, the report you gave was thorough, but um, there are disturbing things in it. Um, for one, uh, on educating six to eighth grade uh, students, uh, I would follow Mark's idea that you know, if you educate young people, they are likely to mimic things. And um, the, there is also the danger that if you, that teenagers like eighth graders might actually pick up on it and say, oh, well, we can do it this far, but let's, you know, just don't overdo it but they probably will. Um, and then it's only at 24 schools. That seems kind of discriminatory to me, <laughs> like just like all the other equity crap this board pushes. Um, and then you want one full-time equivalent person with a medical examiner. Uh, why didn't we hear anything about, or I didn't hear anything about a full-time equivalent to examine these drugs on living patients. Um, and then, let's see, you want to provide bags to people with prescribed opioids? What about just users? And why don't you prescribe less opioids? Then you might not need as many bags. Um, and I favor option B, by the way, building project that was already approved and God only knows why you didn't do it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hermes here. As I stated earlier, I don't trust any of you guys for obvious reasons. You guys are no problems with fraud. Flat out. You have no problems with bending the rules to get what you want. Definitely understand that. And if you want to go ahead and tell me that this is not. Focus on item number 13, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, item number 13 came about because we had elections. Those elections got people voted, got people elected. And I still 
to this day want to know why you guys chose not to have reporting districts when that is the only way to find voter fraud. Isn't that correct, Michael Vu? If ballots are unidentifiable, the easiest way to hide it is to reduce that number to the lowest number possible. You couldn't get it down to one because you had the city, set, city council district, which is six city council districts plus one equals seven. So, Mr. So, Castro, because I have to be fair with all of the other folks that I've mentioned no, this to them. You, I'm you are not you know fair because during a non-agenda item, so you please, shut that person uh, down because you did not I'm like what they were saying. Not. And if you want to shut me down because you are fraudulent, you go ahead and try. Because I don't need to be here, I can do posters. I can send posters all over the place telling everyone how you guys are hiding fraud. You think turning so off my topic. will keep me from... Everyone hearing? No, it's okay. Obviously not. Just letting you know that you're off topic, and I want to be fair to everybody that's here. You are not fair to everyone who's here. You shut someone down during a non-topic item because you did not like how they were talking. Correct or wrong? You are off topic, sir. I okay. You want to? I'll give you time if you want to talk on item number thirteen. No problem. The people who set this in play. Were they elected in a fraudulent election? Yes or no? Did you guys reduce the amount of ballot types so that you could hide fraud? Yes okay. or no? Because that, we're voting on this shit because you guys want to go ahead and commit fraud. Uh, Have, Have a fun. wonderful day. We'll now hear from the individual that requested to speak by phone. Dr. Jeff, I have missed you. Not really. Um, glad you've been taken on and putting your mask back on and off. It's good. It works. Um, so, yeah, Nora, I'm on topic. Um, it's so good because you guys are so intelligent. You're like, we're going to take, you know, money that um, is settlements from Big Pharma and use it to get people back on Big Pharma. Oh, my gosh, it's so good because you're not going to educate them about Big Pharma, right? And that, like, the shots that they get out are killing people. That would be stupid. Oh, but what you're doing is you're like, we're going to spend $8 million on disposal bags. I mean, imagine how many poo bags I would have for my dogs if I spent $8 million. I mean, there's only 3.38 million people in the county. Imagine how many bags that is. I think you guys are being wasteful for the climate. It's actually very sad. Um, but it's interesting. I love how we're like, let's get people off drugs to put them back on drugs. It's just the drugs we want them to take, right? Um, and as long as we educate the kids about it, then they're going to turn into addicts like we like, and then we'll get more money for them as well. Because why would we want to even acknowledge that they're coming over the border, right? And imagine how many people do you think are hooping that while they're crossing the border, I wonder. Uh, do you even know what that means, Nora? Anywho, um, yeah, it's just oh, Dr. Death and the sheriff together again, right? Doing more things to destroy people and spend their money. $8 million, though, on disposable bags. That is probably the smartest, you know, spending of our money that I could possibly think of. Um, wondering what's going to, like, if you've ever actually used all of those bags, who knows? Um, maybe some people can, you know, just suffocate themselves with it. It'd probably be easier to get people to just depopulate in a faster manner. Um, but, yeah, I just love it how we just think educating people about stuff is going to stop things or, you know, just perpetuate it. Um, but it's good. Oh, man, I wish I was there with you, Dr. Death. Thank you. For the record, that speaker was Audra. Final call for Tara Stamos Busig. Not seeing any movement in the chamber. Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, with that, uh, I'm happy to make a motion uh, to support item. You want to put them up? It's not working, it's not working. Should I do a dump, drum roll so you all don't know which one I'm supporting? No, I'm just kidding. So uh, I think item uh, B, and um, I wanna just first thank our team for all the work that they've done on, on this item and what's happening? Okay, recommendation one, option B. I know that there's, um, it's a pretty complex issue and uh, there's been a lot of uh, cross-department collaboration around this work, and so I want to thank you for all the work that you've done around it. Um, that particularly, 
around um, county overdose surveillance and the response that's taken place uh, with our behavioral health department. And so um, I know that there's still work that's being done to identify additional funding to, to, for the Recovery Bridge Center. Uh, I think it seems to me like this is what folks have said that would work well and it allows us to really do funding for long-term versus just short-term. Um, I will say that I want to make sure that it's uh, funding that goes for folks that are everywhere, but I understand that the location is the East County Recovery Bridge Center, but there's people who come there from all over the county, right? Am I correct? Uh, the the um, populations of focus with the Recovery Bridge Center would be people living relatively proximate to, so we expect higher utilization among people living in East County. That's kind of been part of the rationale for developing that. Mm, okay. All right. Okay. All right. And did you, um, I had some questions and some comments. So, um, first of all, I really appreciate all the work. I, first of all, appreciate all the work that went into preparing the framework in the first place. Um, and secondly, I really appreciate um, the work to continue and be thoughtful about how we uh, use our funds uh, in the most impactful way possible and uh, possible and bringing back to us um, some options to, to reallocate funding um, to be as, as useful and as impactful as possible on this major issue. Um, and fentanyl and opioid addiction is just such an enormous concern in my community um, and among parents that I speak with, and this is one of my top priorities. So I, I think it's really, um, it's just really wonderful that we were able to win this money from the opioid settlement in the first place and then um, devise a, a thoughtful strategy on how to invest it back in our community. So I think that's the big, you know, obviously very supportive. Um, I am kind of leaning to option one, um, A. That was what I had initially thought walking in here, um, but I want to just better understand kind of the trade-offs. Um, the, the East County Center, what would be, how would we, it's a one-time capital investment for the East County Recovery Bridge Center. Where would the money come from for ongoing, like OMM, o &M, ongoing operation and maintenance or, you know, services? Within the Recovery Bridge Center once it's established? Yeah, right, because I think, yeah. right, we have two choices, right? One is basically take this uh, $7.5 million and support, support the ongoing investments to, that we already yeah. were planning to get to 2030, 2031. That's right. Um, or the other is to kind of cut those other services short a little bit early. Um, what, what's the date they would, they would terminate currently? So with option A, um, as Dr. McDonald noted, uh, FY 3031 with option B, 2829. 2829. So we'd Correct. cut them short by 2029, but we'd have money for this um, East County Recovery Bridge yeah. Center. Uh, but I'm, I'm not clear. But the operational. The operational, be, right? Because yeah. this talks yeah. about 7.5 for a one-time capital investment. That's right. So where does the money come from for ongoing operations and stuff? Yeah. So. Um, uh, what what the CSU RBC um, overall would contain in terms of categories of services would be a crisis stabilization unit and immediately adjacent to it or what we call recovery bridge center, um, which has traditionally been referred to as a sobering center, sobering service. Um, the CSUs that we support, uh, we support primarily um, through Medi-Cal funding um, so that, you know, with a local match. Um, but we are able to draw down uh, through the public insurance system to support um, the preponderance of works, work that happens in CSUs. The Recovery Bridge Center has, um, until recently, not had a similar drawdown opportunity, but with the establishment through CalAIM of the community supportive services, there is an opportunity to draw down um, some funding. Um, there's a, one of the community supportive services. There are a number of them. One of them is uh, specifies sobering services. Um, we haven't done an analysis um, that would enable me to tell you exactly what percentage of overall operational costs would be covered through that. Uh, through drawdown. the drawdown. Um, but there mm -hmm. is that that funding available. That would certainly be uh, that would um, uh, be important to ongoing operations. I think it's fair to say. Um, I mean, personally, I, I don't feel comfortable making a decision on this without that information. I mean, the idea of spending seven and a half million on a capital project when we don't have a, 
any plan or any revenue or a theory of, of, of the case of how we're going to get the money to continue to run the bridge center. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. So I think for me, I mean, this is for my colleagues. I would definitely... Right, sir, sorry. Let, me, let me just... Um, so the reason why um, I leaned over towards the East County recovery one was because um, the county has been for a long time trying to find a location in East County. So we have... So can I ask the CAO to... Um, jump in and kind of give a perspective on this because I know that we have some in other regions and um, we have many times opened up um, locations where we have the foundation and then we continue to operate. So can you um, provide some information on that? Absolutely, Chairwoman and, and Vice Chair. Um, as you know, we've been working for the last several years to open up um, uh, a network of the crisis stabilization units throughout the region. We've got a couple up in North County. We have one down in your area. Uh, we have been working uh, to transform the ARCC Old County facility into the one in East County. We're looking at something with uh, Children's Hospital there. And then, of course, we've been looking at UCSD and, and whatnot. But you'll recall from the many briefings that we've had um, how we're going to build out this network for the crisis stabilization units. This one adds a little bit more uh, because of the tremendous amount of need in um, sobering centers. That's one of the things that we're hearing constantly whenever we're out in the community. And, and Luke's been getting, uh, obviously has built that into the plan. And then also the, the treatment services. So this, uh, this particular location uh, came before the board last year and was approved as part of the capital program. Uh, to build this out, and um, uh, as as part of that, we uh, we applied for a grant to help with that. We did not achieve that um, grant. We were not successful in that. So this helps bridge that total funding of the capital project that was um, uh, already approved. However, I I would say to your point um, specifically on the operational costs. I mean, that is something that we consistently do, and Luke has to put that into our whole behavioral health services. And we have almost a billion dollars of revenue that comes into behavioral health services, and he would need to prioritize his budget to be able to operate these. Now, I'm not going to say we don't need option A, too. We do. We need funding for as long as we can, but we're going to continue to, uh, to work that. And to be able to open up and complete the bridge center we have an immediate need to identify enough to fulfill the capital requirement uh, in what's already been approved by this board. Uh, Luke, is there anything else? Did I, did I state that accurately? Is there anything else you want to add? I mean, I think it just, I would just say, I think very honestly, I, obviously these are both incredibly important needs, right? I mean, one set of needs, one set of investments, option A, is going to benefit our whole county. Um, I think option B uh, concentrates the benefits in uh, region of our county, which is fine too. You know, I think, um, but for me, if I'm kind of weighing the two equally, the one that's going to have the broad regional benefit, I'm more inclined to. But if we had a better understanding of how a capital investment could unlock additional resources, if I if we if I just better understood how moving forward with option B. Um, a 7.5 million then leads to more money to the region, right? Because we're able to use it to, to file and draw down. Then I think I would certainly be tipped in favor of option B, right? I, I, but I think I, I think that's where I'm at right now is without me really understanding how kind of how much we're going to be able to draw down in option B, I'm kind of leaning to option A. But if you know, I don't know, Luke, how long it would take. I don't want to hold us up a long time. But if there's any way we could get that in the next like two weeks that are or board meeting, I, I think this is an important part of the, the conversation of how are we going to be able to draw down additional resources yeah. to operate this facility. So I'll say kind of one more thing about it and then invite Amy Thompson, the HSA CFO, to, to, to comment as well since we're talking about strictly financial matters. I, I would note that among the services that behavioral health um, services establishes a network. Um, RBC services are relatively inexpensive on the operational Sorry, say that again? RBC services are relatively inexpensive because they are mostly observational services. Um, they are not part of the, the more robust clinical drug medical service system, um, which does, um, you know, which is supported through substantial medical drawdown. Um, 
and there is a, you know, it looks like there's on, there is some ongoing operational upside relative to what there has been traditionally, and we have run these services traditionally at greater, to, you know, sort of with a greater proportion of total cost borne locally, um, because the this new reimbursement that's established with community supports again is just a part of a, uh, a recently established thing with um, uh, with Calain. So, um, I, yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, that. Though I noted that I don't have like exact numbers with respect to what the the kind of revenue and total cost relationship is, um, it is not a terribly expensive service. I'm, I'm less interested in the revenue and cost ratio, although that's interesting as well. I'm more interested in the basic idea of how do we take a little bit of county money and turn it into more money, right? And so the I'm I'm really interested in if we're making a fixed capital cost investment, how much additional um, federal dollars is it, could that potentially draw down for our region you know how do we take one dollar and turn it into two as opposed to one dollar just being one so so it's less the cost to revenue ratio and more what's our potential um, you know maximum ability to, to do some kind of federal drawdown it would probably um, also include state money as well and state, Holly, do and you state. have any recommend I'm sorry uh, thank you thank you chairwoman Vargas I just wanted Holly, to add we were um, just talking about regional impact and as part of our discussions um, with the alternatives to incarceration group we talked a lot about the fact that there's only the one sobering center in central which is in the city of san diego and there being a need for a location um, particularly in the east county we looked at ems transport data for individuals who were um, picked up for public intoxication encroachment um, and that location also being a crisis stabilization unit being useful uh, for, from a law enforcement perspective. So regional um, sort of impact related to jail, um, jail populations and the availability of that resource for law enforcement. Just wanted to add that to the That's incredibly helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but just to sort of, Luke, how long would it take if, for you guys to, to figure this, to kind of do some uh, tentative calculations or projections on what you could potentially um, draw down in terms of annual operating expenses. I gather that we could do Give that. Me, uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I just want to make sure that if we don't go with the East County Recovery Bridge Center, if we wait until we have all the money, we're going to have a huge service gap in East, East County. And I just want to make sure that that's very clear. So it is a high priority to make sure that we um, fulfill our regional obligation with the crisis unit, stabilization units all over, and that is uh, the highest priority at this point. And, and, um, and I know that uh, there might be some other folks that want to speak, and, and, um, and I want us to step back also as supervisors to think about how the models, because I think we're asking for some, uh, it's really good to ask for a lot of questions right now because I think it's really important. But we voted on this dais many a times for things and for concepts where we don't have all of the money, right? I'm just asking. Uh, but we have the concepts for things and projects where we know have good opportunities uh, for the region as a whole and not necessarily uh, you know, have all the answers. So I just want to make sure that we've done that in the past, and we've we've had that president, and so, um, and we've trusted staff to come back and give us, you know, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, who I keep I keep looking at people, looking at each other, and, and and talking about different things. So tell me, who do I turn it over to? I, I just would really like to get an answer to the question yeah. I've now asked three times. It's a pretty simple question. I ask, how long would it take to come back with those calculations? It could be a year, it could be six months, it could be a month. I've asked the question three times. Well, we can come back, but I don't know that we would have an answer at, in, in two weeks. We're I didn't ask, would you have an answer in two weeks? I, I really am asking an honest question. I'm asking, look, there's a great idea here. I want to better understand what the kind of plan would be or what the options would be in terms of um, you know, drawing down federal money to bring money back to our community so that we could continue always magnifying and amplifying more and more resources. How, would it be a month, six months, two years? Like what is the, what, how long would it take to kind of look at the programs um, that are out there for Medicaid and the proposed operations of this East County Recovery Center and come back with some projections? So, I'll, wait, I'll defer wait, to you, Luke, on, on that. I'm just. Oh, but wait a second before I, before you, no, because I, I want to make sure I understand the question. 
because I think that they can probably come up with a plan. If Dr. Luke could probably not sleep today and come up with a plan for tomorrow by noon that has exactly what the projections are, it doesn't mean that the plan from the federal government will come down because first of all, the federal government is shut down right now in terms of not being able to do anything. So even if they come back tomorrow and say they can find a million dollars from the federal government, is that sufficient? Because I don't know that that's, is that what you're asking no, for? No, that's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking Luke to not go to bed. I'm asking Luke in like a reasonable manner to come back with like, look, we know these are the Medicaid, we know based on where, what our Callie waiver says, we know based on uh, kind of the changes that have been unfolding in Medicaid, we know based on what this East County Recovery Bridge Center is gonna offer, what is it, what are some, what is the projection? We know that it's not a promise. We know that we yeah. have to apply for the funding. We know that there's, a, remains a lot of uncertainty. I'm just asking for, you know, would it be a month, two months, three months? It's like a little bit of a, a research and modeling exercise. Like how long would that take? It's a thing that I think that we could do, as Helen's noting, re relatively quickly. And sorry for not addressing that with more specificity. I do want to make one clarification point, given how you asked, if that's okay. Um, what we anticipate with the CalAIM reimbursement opportunity through community, uh, through the community supports program, um, is certainly not revenue that is in addition to cost. It will be some fraction of total cost. I completely understand. Don't worry. I got that part. So, so that's what the... Person, yeah, co co totally get it. It's not going to be above cost. Yeah, absolutely. And, and given that this is a service that, um, you know, that in other settings, uh, you know, is it's used by people on uh, who are enrolled in Medi-Cal, but also people who are not enrolled in Medi-Cal. So there would, be, there would be sort of a further fractioning of, uh, of total cost coverage through that revenue source. That would be actually helpful too, to include, yeah, that, the Medi-Cal um, usage. That. But c could I also then suggest, I think important for Amy to, to weigh in. Sorry, I saw. Uh, so I think, Vice Chair, we could do that in pretty short order using a set of assumptions as Luke described in terms of the mix of uh, Medi-Cal population that will be there. There will be an outpatient component for SUD. Um, we do have a lot of experience billing under drug Medi-Cal for outpatient services. We do know that um, the Medi-Cal population that was part of um, the expanded population under the Affordable Care Act, we get reimbursed almost 90% um, federal dollars for those services, so we can look at the scope for the RBC and the outpatient piece, make some assumptions around the, um, the sobering, the pure sobering center piece that's not connected to, to the outpatient billing um, under Cal Aim and come up with you know, rough estimates based on some assumptions as to how much federal revenue um, and some state revenue as well that we could draw down. If you're asking like, if, you know, our operating costs, how much of our total operating costs would be federally and state covered, I think is what you're asking. That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly, so what I would love to do, if it's okay with my colleagues, I'd love to um, uh, uh, support this moving forward today with an amendment, an additional amendment, just asking our team to come back in some reasonable time period that doesn't require Luke uh, not going to bed um, to, to answer these questions about uh, kind of rough projections on how much we could uh, be, potentially be able to, to draw down by um, uh, pursuing um, state and federal matching funds and, and really looking like what's the maximum that we could get um, not, not, not the minimum, but really what's the maximum we could get, what the caps are. So that would be great. And if that's sure. amenable to my colleagues, I'm happy to support this. And I don't want to put a time limit on you all, um, but a reasonable time. <laughs> well, we do have term limits. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So yes, a, a reasonable time that it, uh, acknowledges that we have work to do and we'd like the information sooner rather than later. You got it. Supervisor okay. Anderson, uh, did you have other comments? All right, well, only in the... Since we worked this issue pretty hard. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say is, you know, we spent a year, uh, Supervisor Fletcher and I spent a year putting the uh, opioid settlement framework together. And I just want to compliment uh, Dr. Bergman and his staff for their fine work. Uh, everything that we had hoped, not only have you delivered uh, with evidence-based solutions, but I think that you've also added improvements to our early plan. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for your hard work. It's much appreciated. You know, uh, the reason why Nathan chose to work with me on this issue is because we had such a high opioid uh, crisis 
uh, when you look in San Diego County, sadly, I'm not proud of this, but we're an epicenter. And hopefully with the bridge and with all the other work that we're doing, we're gonna see positive results, improve people's lives and lift people in our community. So thank you. Thank you, sir. We have a motion and it was an adjusted motion. Okay. Uh, Chair, do we need any precise language for my amendment? I think we do, right? That would be helpful, I can go over um, yeah. So I guess would to be at, add on a, um, a recommendation um, asking the CAO to come back in a reasonable time frame with some analysis regarding the maximum um, we could be able to draw down in state and federal matching dollars to fund um, operation, uh, ongoing operating expenses for this and this facility. Does that um, work? I just want to clarify, it's a report back. To a report back. Thank this you. is passing today, but as part of the recommendation is asking for a report back. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we might have a motion and a second, please vote. Chairwoman Vargas, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. All right, we're now gonna move on to discussion item number six. I'm gonna turn it over to public comment. Thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. We have eight requests to speak on this item, six in person and two requesting to speak by phone. I also note for the record that we received 81 e comments, 54 in favor, 23 in opposition, and one neutral. Any members of the public that requested to speak on item six by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speaker, starting with those in favor of this item. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'd like to invite forward Truth, Consuelo, Paul the Bold, and Michael Brando. I've called your name, please come forward. And they'll be followed by the speakers in opposition of this item, Pam and Mark. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks for not gaveling me. Um, uh, Paul Bold here. Thank you for bringing this item up. It's about time Sandag's obstinance in not removing the road user charge from its official plans is noted officially. Um, I think, frankly, that Sandag's stewardship of money, its continual cries for more, more, more for the road user charge. I think all of that is really disgusting. It's anti-people. Um, I really don't see any point in even continuing Sandag. I think the board should be dissolved in, in its present form at least and um, reconstituted with a focus on actually doing what it should be doing, which is transportation planning, not urban planning. Um, I think, you know, continuing to spend money and time and effort on just doing what the people keep rejecting is a total waste of funds and an, an abuse of our tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker, please. This is truth and I love and hate Sandag. The 2025 regional plan will cost over $165 billion, yet they claim that it's a digital platform that collects information from vehicles, delivery trucks, e-bikes, and scooters into a centralized data hub. Travel lanes can be dedicated to different uses at different times of day, end quote. That means the regional plan is inherently a tracking system to control road use, and not a single rep has spoken against this digital regional road surveillance system yet. This little mashup of Hassan and crew describes it all. Maybe a couple of freeways shouldn't exist in San Diego, period. People say, oh my gosh, he's not only doesn't want to expand the freeways, he's going to take them away, and that's true. I would be extremely happy with 800 miles of high occupancy toll lanes, and I will be happy that people will be paying for the use of the system. People still, oh my gosh, it's a conspiracy theory. It's United Station 21, you know, agenda. But using some sustainable development goals that are basically defined by the United Nations. 
uh, the goals that the United Nations won for the cities for the horizon of 2030. Creating, once again, a mechanism that will be in some way supranational, where we'd have this binational association of governments. And here's what a Sandag conference room poster board reads, quote, three key technologies to fuel this revolution, the internet of things, big data, and artificial intelligence, a transportation system that is shared, connected, and autonomous, end quote. So Nora, when is the right time for the ultimate plan? Because I'm gonna say there is no right time for consolidation of power and control. It's Agenda 21 in the open. That's all they're really pushing at Sandag. Next speaker, please. Did you call me? Final call for Michael Brando, Consuelo, Pam, and Mark. Oh. Mark, the support people aren't done. I actually am in support also, but except that it's a moot point because they're going to do this anyway in other ways. So uh, again, people should see this YouTube video title to understand what's going on uh, with Sandag. Uh, you can watch Rosa Corey's video from three minutes and 30 seconds through the rest of it. That's very important. She, she's an expert court witness who will explain it to you. Uh, and they're not gonna give me time here in a minute and have to. Then you can see these uh, titles. This is a KUSI story, I think, or it's, it's a news story, if you Google it, where Mayor Wells is literally saying, he, he's a board member of Sandag, and he's saying that they're not doing the will of the people, they have their own agenda. Now, what he doesn't tell you is what Rosa Corey tells you about what their agenda is, the UN Agenda 21, uh, which is trying to take control of the entire world. Um, and uh, now, this is a title of a YouTube video. It's the Sandag meeting where you can see our government, uh, that Nora is the, the, not only the chair here of our supervisors, but she's the chair of Sandag. And uh, you can literally see at this meeting them planning our demise and, and your lack of sovereignty, your loss of sovereignty to become the North American Union. At 14 minutes, uh, Nora is committed to removing all barriers to the border. Um, let's see. Uh, and they talk about controlling your movement. Um, that's at an hour and 24 minutes and 15 seconds, uh, etc. You also need to see these other videos to understand because this is different groups together to do a globalist agenda. You want to agenda Klaus Schwab, see this title, where he states he's penetrating governments, including half the uh, cabinet of Canada, and now ours. Next speaker, please. So, Consuelo, so no, Hassan, it's not a conspiracy. It's actually here in the UN actual program, uh, UN Agenda 21. No conspiracies about it. Um, the thing is, is that it was uh, VMT. Now, RUC, it didn't pass with the people, and they're testing the waters, so therefore they're going to throw it on... Uh, this SB 399. Um, I don't quite understand all of this, uh, but all I know is that there's a lot of uh, trying to save face to the constituents, to have the people have faith in government, when in actuality it's just going to prolong um, what they have planned. And it's, you know, it's not going to be that long, but because people are so permissive, they're not involved. They're just allowing these local politicians to do whatever, um, however. And so, um, yeah, it's just a matter of time. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, regarding this. So, yeah, people, whoever's, all three of you listening, Oh yeah, well, the U okay yeah in the UK 
they're already having their 15 minute cities. Um, you can look that up. There's no conspiracy about that, Hassan. Um, what else? Yeah, just do your due diligence and spread the word because it is coming around the corner. No conspiracy about it. UN Agenda 21. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Michael, I'm really glad Joel put this on the agenda today uh, in spite of him being told today that he's making inflammatory narratives and he's mean-spirited and ill-advised. I'm glad that this is on the agenda. However, what I'm not glad about is the double gaslighting that goes on with some members who stand, a member who is on the chair of this board and SANDAG. Bill Wells, mayor of El Cajon, actually said that the whole SANDAG plan needs to be completely eliminated. Hassan Ikarada, the CEO of SANDAG, said that people are going to have to pay one way or another. Jack Shu of La Mesa said that the most dangerous thing a person can do is drive in a car alone. And of course, all these incentives, uh, in th these statements are basically incentives to change people's belief systems to get them out of their cars and to stop driving. What I have an issue with is the double gaslighting because on the one hand, we're being told that, okay, the county's saying, yeah, we're against all this, but there's all this talk about these charges, these fees coming in through the back door, maybe even coming somehow through the California Air Resources Board, which Nora Vargas was uh, assigned to by Gavin Newsom. So th there's something fishy going on. Again, I, I liked what Consuelo said. People are here are trying to save face, but there's some kind of other operation going on. And it's not a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy fact. Yep. We'll now hear from the individual that requested to speak by phone on this item. Because Hassan was right. You're going to pay one way or another. You guys sit here and you got to listen or read what they're saying. So they're in opposition to her mile traveled road usage charge. It doesn't mean that they want to get rid of the road usage charge altogether, just the her mile traveled. And it's coming down the state no matter what. Okay, their state's going to put it through. And you guys haven't even had your plan okayed by the state to make sure that taking this out of the plan is going to even give you funding because you guys got to make up for the $163 billion. And, Joel, as you like to say that you're doing something right to make it look good, you're the one that wants to charge the EVs, uh, electric vehicles, a charge for per kilowatt, right? So it's going to come from the people either way. Don't let these people fool you and make you think that, oh, we're taking this out. No. No, they're not. They just want you to believe that so then you act like then you can come and, 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 and accept what they're doing. Everything is about control. They need you to stop driving. They even say that if you get in electric vehicles, it doesn't matter because we need to get people out of their cars and onto public transit, biking and walking. Pay attention to what they say. They tell you exactly what they are doing. But if you do not pay attention, then you will not see clearly. These people are set out to make sure that you are in a 15-minute city. It has nothing to do with giving you freedom. It has everything to do with taking every freedom that you have and making sure that you are re reliant on the government so that they can give you soil and green, sewer water, bugs, and pretend that they're saving the planet by putting you in a densely populated area where you have to get a permit to go see your family. Everyone needs to wake up. This is a show. This has nothing to do with taking out any cities. It has Thank you for the record that speaker was Audra. <laughs> Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on this item. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
We're almost done with the meeting. Can you just be civil, please? Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two things, I pulled this for, uh, one, there was some confusion that we were saying that no road usage charge. This was to mirror the sand egg vote. We already voted on it. I, want, I thought it was important enough that our board ratify the vote that we took. Um, but if somebody builds uh, a bridge and there's a toll, that's not included in this. If somebody increases uh, a lane and that's a managed lane, that's not included in this. And nor was that true of the vote. Uh, but I want to make sure that because Caltrans had a concern over that and I wanted to honor their concern. But approval of this item would align the county's position on road user charge per vehicle mile traveled fees with Sandake's position to oppose these charges moving forward. So uh, we've already done the vote at Sandag. Uh, I want to give kudos to you, Chair, because uh, you have defended this vote uh, at least six months, <laughs> and we still have people saying we don't believe in our vote, and I just wanted to put it to bed once and for all. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. And I make that motion. Chairwoman Vargas, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. Next item on the agenda is um, we usually ask uh, we ask uh, my colleagues if they have any items to report on for board committee member board committees. Do any of my colleagues have any committee reports? I just want to really quickly let you know that I um, I was in Mexico City on behalf of the county and Sandag for the delegation with the Chamber of Commerce and had a very successful. I guess it was 24, 30 hours or something like that. Very intense um, couple of, couple of uh, meetings. A lot of discussions around water issues, the Quan River Valley, um, East of Mesa, with the delegation on behalf of uh, San Diego, with the mayor and a couple of other um, local elected officials, and uh, met with uh, the Mexican delegation as well, um, and trying to get additional dollars and um, to look at uh, um, addressing and getting additional funds uh, for uh, Imperial Beach and Coronado as well. And so uh, that continues to move forward. I wanted just to share that with you. And, um, and then at SANDAG, I think everybody knows um, that we are going to be uh, hiring a new uh, CEO. We are going to be hearing that item on Friday. And so the board is going to be approving that process. Very, very thorough process. I've already hired a consulting firm that's going to be uh, um, helping me in that process. And so more information to come. And other than that, next item on the agenda is adjournments. And so um, the first, let's see, we're going to hear, do you have any public comments first? Not an agenda. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, sir, I got it. I'm running the meeting. Don't worry. Thank you, Chairwoman Vargas. We are now going to return to the remaining non-agenda public comment. We have six remaining requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, four in person and two requesting to speak by phone. For those that requested to speak by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. I'd like to invite forward Maria Elena Greenman Lind, Truth, Paul the Bold, and Consuelo. If I've called your name, please come forward. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Good afternoon. I know it's been a very long and busy day, but I'm grateful to be here with you because the message I have to carry today is still very important. Um, I am Maria Elena Greenman Lind. I am the Youth Development Project Coordinator for Juvenile Justice Advocates of California. Adam Motera spoke earlier about us requesting funding and waiting for a response. I have developed a program to work with our youth at East Mesa Juvenile Detention Facility and at YTC. I have submitted to you 21 letters of youth advocating for us and advocating for themselves. I want to introduce you to Autumn. Her letter is in here. When I met her, she was at East Mesa, very hard, complex, very hard to get in touch with her heart. I have been able to get her 
on her own recognizance to be able to write you guys a four-page letter of the need for continuing programming. Um, constantly be hearing from staff at both facilities that there is not enough people going in to do program for the youth. Um, they're not able to connect with the youth. And so they are very hyped on this program we've been able to uh, create. These letters speak volumes. Um, we come from a very heart-centered space, so we get to the core issues. We begin to talk about healing and understanding where it begins so that we can begin to address who we are, find our identity, help them to get to those core moments where they can be empowered and find their voices. Um, we are advocates for the youth, and today I would like to be able to be here with them, even though they can't be present. Um, we really would like to ask, to please take into consideration, we have three districts left who have not replied to us on that funding um, because unfortunately it is running out. We are looking on the outside, but they are your babies. They are in the probation department. They are part of the, the, the county and they are yours. And we ask for you guys to please support those spaces because these hearts and these minds are so precious and they are all yours to take care of. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Amy from my team is coming back, uh, coming out. Um, and you have my information. You should always just call me directly. Girl. I do want to bug you. Right. See <laughs> okay. you. Thank you for being here. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Paula Bold. As I remarked last time, we're governed by two constitutions, the United States and the California versions. From what I have seen, the California Constitution puts people and rights first, unlike the US Constitution, which puts government first. The articles and rights are an afterthought, amendments after the fact. So government in California is, if you will, a second thought, literally a byword, a bunch of turds. So think of that, Sheriff Vargas, next time you do one of your pro-government anti-people rants. You're calling people out of order is so highly selective that it is an insult and violates the Constitution. Last meeting, you let an old woman ramble on and on about her own proud history while you cut off several speakers for being off topic while they were complaining about the county. Calling people out of order on a non-agenda item, as you did today, is absolutely perverse. And at the last meeting, you randomly and explicitly allowed clapping for no road user charged at San Diego the previous Friday, your thing. Yet you regularly chastised the audience for constitutionally allowed clapping when not aligned with your pet projects. But let me ask, do you think there is a reason why so many people are now directly citing and quoting the law and the authorities? Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hey, it's Truth the Little Activist with a recognizable shoes, or at least that's what a lady called me last time I was here. So here we go, thanks for this swag. You know, I don't think I'm gonna wear it though. In this month's county secret spending, Tara gave $20,000 to Filipino Worker Center of Southern California who are based in LA, and $25,000 to the Walter Monk Foundation. Walter showed zero care for humanity when he contributed to atomic bomb testing on Bikini Atoll and Inuatuk Atoll. And Jim gave $50,000 to Oceanside Community Services Television Corporation for a mobile TV truck. It's a waste of money. And he should rethink that spending because he's actually helping keep that little worm, Kevin Teddy Stevenson, at work as a broadcaster at KOCT. The total debt these supervisors have put us in in only one month, over $1.1 million. And that's exactly why that spending is no longer shared in these meetings, because now it gets to skyrocket in secret. Now I realize that the term smart growth or smart city is the exact same thing as Planned Parenthood or reproductive health care, vernacular deception. Planned Parenthood founder, eugenicist Margaret Sanger worked with Clarence Gamble of Procter & Gamble. Here's Margaret's letter to him from December 10th, 1939, quote, if the enemy started to work, they might make it difficult. 
Well, the colored Negroes have great respect for white doctors. They can get closer to their own members and lay their cards on the table, which means their ignorance, superstitions, and doubts. If we can train the Negro doctor, it will have far-reaching results among the colored people. The minister should be trained, perhaps by the Federation, as to our ideals and the goals we hope to reach. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Sincerely yours, Margaret Sanger, end quote. So, Nora, are you ready to denounce this racist organization? You should consider it. For the record, I denounced Margaret Sanger many years ago. What year? Just kidding. Um, I doubt that they would have that. Anyways, I wanted to uh, read words of one of our Palestinian sisters. I won't say her name, but uh, she wrote. Can you please state your name? Consuelo. Yes, we remember. We know what it feels like to be terrified and terrorized. We absolutely know what it feels like to see innocent children die. There's nothing worse. None of this was unprovoked, and none of it should be surprising. It is awful, it is devastating, it is unfortunate, but it is not a surprise. And if you're surprised, my God, you have not been paying attention for the past 75 years. Did you think colonization would be a polite process? Did you think when we say free Palestine that we would wait forever for the nonviolent solution? How much further did you think you could push this colonization and occupation before it exploded. When people have nothing left to lose, they go all in. It's too late to cry for the innocent now. I cannot imagine going through what the people of both countries have endured, but especially the brothers and sisters of Palestine. They have endured so much for decades. Killing and wars are horrific atrocities brought to us only by governments. No sane person on the planet wishes death upon another, but governments led by power-hungry psychopaths do, and they use the young and innocent to do the killings for them. The people of the planet are becoming wise and waking up to what governments all over the planet are really doing, creating dependent slaves. The Palestinians were beyond fed up. One day soon, the people on the planet will come together out of being fed up too. Too many on the planet are suffering in many on many different levels for absolutely no other reason but greed. Look around you. Government has the most money now that it's ever had in history, yet there is so much poverty. Thank you. Your time is up. Now we'll hear from the individual that requested to speak by phone. Amen, sis. Life is a business. That's what's so sad, but whatever. I wasn't expecting to. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, Nora, it doesn't matter if you, you know, uh, just like, you know, whatever, uh, Margaret Sanger, you still love babies being ripped apart limb by limb. That's why we have to pay attention to what's going on around us. All of these people, it isn't about you know, um, like they want us to be pitted against each other, like Consuelo was saying, and they want us to, you know, choose one side or another, and we're, what we're doing is, like, not paying attention to what's really going on. These people all tell you exactly what they are up to and what they are doing. It's just up to you to pay attention and to understand that it is all lies in order for total destruction. These people don't care about lives. They don't care about peace because they want to destroy one side or the other, all while the men, women, and children that are innocent are suffering the consequences of their actions, just like we do here locally on a massive scale. You can't sit there and be like, I denounce this person, but you engage and, and support the exact things that they're doing, which are murdering children, their babies, and we're sitting here acting like it's okay. And you sit there and you silence people for absolutely no reason at all. You've got to be on top of it. It's non freaking agenda. I can talk about whatever we want, but you can't handle the truth. And that's what's so sad. You had to take that woman out of the board meeting because she was suffering and crying out. You can't have people hear that so that they know what is going on around them. People are suffering, and it's at your hands, and you guys don't even care. 
I can't imagine looking in the mirror being one of you guys and going, I'm doing the right thing, because you know what? Satan is proud of you guys, because he is. You are doing the right thing in that realm, in the darkness, in the evil side of things. But you could turn around and walk in the light. Your time is up. Chairwoman of Vargas, that concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. If you'd like, we can hear from the speakers on closed session items. We have two requests to speak on matters on the closed session. I'm sorry, four, one in person and three requesting to speak by phone. I'd like to invite Ford Truth. All right, Truth. Case A is Arthur Price versus the County of San Diego. Food Not Bombs, along with five homeless individuals, also sued the city of San Diego. It's alleged that instead of providing hotel rooms, homeless people were offered mass sheltering at the convention center during the lockdown era. That would have gone against the official virus narrative about social distancing. KC, motor vehicle lawsuit for Scott Lyles versus the county and former county chief paper shuffler, Ernest Dronenberg. And case D is a deprivation of rights case for DS versus the county, four sheriff's deputies, the city of San Diego, one SDPD officer and 10 does. Last year in Little Italy, Deputy Jason Bunch went to a condo complex to serve an eviction notice to a woman named Yan Lee. Yan answered the door while holding a knife down by her side. Deputy Jason Bunch handed her the notice and then freaked when he saw the knife and pointed his gun at Yan and demanded she drop the knife, but he also kept calling it a gun. Yan doubted that he was a real officer and asked for his badge number, but he never gave it. Yan eventually closed her door. More officers arrived later and a sheriff identified himself as police rather than as a sheriff. They then entered Jan's condo with a key given to them by management. They found Jan in a bedroom still holding the knife, so two sheriffs shot her several times with a beanbag gun. Apparently they had horrible aim and only a few rounds hit Jan, so she headed for her front door. A dog handling officer was stabbed and then SDPD Rogelio Medino, Sheriff Sergeant Daniel Nickel, Deputy Javier Medina, and Deputy David Williams all opened fire on Jan. What exactly happened is not shown clearly in the video, even though at least two officers should have body cam footage. What was clear is that all the officers stumbled out of the room like clowns out of a car. Why they thought they needed at least 12 officers to deal with one woman reflects pretty poorly of their training. It looked like they, could, they couldn't even agree on the tactic of operation. While well, DA Summer claims all the deputies are free and clear of wrongdoing, and Yan Sun says he, they escalated for no reason. Thank you. I'll now hear from the individual that requested to speak by phone on item 15. That's closed session matters. And it's pathetic. So, A, you guys are using, a, you know, homeless people couldn't even get a hotel room, yet you're giving these hotel rooms during, you know, your whole COVID-19 pandemic to whomever. Um, and the people that really need it, you're just stuffing them inside someplace. You have people working for you that are retaliating against people, calling them all sorts of names. But it's funny because if people are called a white supremacist or something like that, it's like that's totally okay these days. But this fed fatal deputy involved shooting is very very disturbing because you know i mean we can beat people up and it's totally exonerated we can also shoot people down and kill them and have it also be like you know they just should know what they're doing it's very sad what's going on because you guys don't even know how to deal with anybody who supposedly has some kind of mental health issue and you they go in and these people with some kind of authority that they're supposed to be protecting us are sitting here and killing people murdering them murdering them with weapons that's exactly why the people need guns is because we have a threat of the government coming after us and we can't do anything about it because you guys sit there and you exonerate each other and you're like no there's nothing to see here who do you go to when the people that are supposed to protect you are murdering you what are you supposed to do huh what are you supposed to do and then you want to take our guns and say you know what the police need them the police need them the people don't but the police do so that they can murder the people it's so good. You guys are so good at doing exactly what you've been told to do. And like I said, Satan is fucking happy with you guys. Because everything that you're doing is pure evil, and you don't even care. And you sit there and gloat like you're walking in the light. You're walking in darkness. And you're headed straight for the abyss. And that's on you guys. Like I said, you could turn away, but you choose to do this. You choose to walk down this path. You choose to do this to the people. And that's what people need to see is this is your choice. You are choosing it. Okay? Because you could choose to turn away, and you choose not to. 
you choose to continue down the destructive. Thank you, and Chairwoman Vargas, that concludes public comment on closed session matters. Thank you. Uh, for adjournments, I'm going to turn it over to um, Supervisor Anderson in memory of Ophir Levestein. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> you know, while I didn't know the mayor personally, many of my constituents did, and he had a profound impact on their life. So sadly, I'm adjourning today's meeting in memory of Ophir uh, Lee Liebenstein, who was the incredible mayor of San Diego's sister city, Sharar Ha Negev. And I apologize for pronunciations. Uh, he was in southern Israel. Mir Ophir was killed this past weekend defending his community during a series of terrorist attacks by Hamas. He was born in the port town of Elat in southern Israel, and a true build, he was a true bridge builder for peace. He was known far and wide for his remarkable efforts to bring Jews and Arab Israelis, Palestinians, and Bedouins together. His commitment to fostering harmony was truly exceptional. Miro Fear's impact extended beyond peace building. He was a champion for employment opportunities and played a crucial role in shaping industries in Shahir Hanivagiv. His vision ensured that every individual, regardless of their faith and background, had a fair shot at success. His memory will learn, live on as a testament to the power of unity, opportunity, and compassion. Sadly, this most recent terrorist attack uh, in Israel has become a modern day Holocaust. Only the Holocaust murdered more Jews in modern time, in fact, in the history of time. And Madam Chair, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but if it's possible for us to end in a moment of silence for those who suffered through this modern Holocaust, their families and their friends, uh, I'd like to do that. I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but I'd like to request it. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um. And so I am going to be presenting two adjournments um, in memory of Jose Leandro Chavarria Soto and Blanca Yadira Mercedes Vasquez Lobio. Um, Jose Leandro Chavarria Soto was born on August 25th, 1939 in Las Cruces, Chihuahua, Mexico. He was born to Soledad Soto and Anciento Chavarria. He was a noble human being as a child, adolescent, young man, and as an adult and as a senior citizen. Child of working class family, his need to work to contribute financially to his family kept him from completing school. Since he was unable to attend school consistently, sadly, he would fail his coursework. At 11 years old, he began to work in a mechanic shop. He started by washing tools, running errands, and helping the mechanics. He soon learned to fix cars. A boy amongst men, he was able to earn money for his family. As a young man, he immigrated to Mexicali and then Los Angeles, California, where he met the love of his life, Yadilia whom he married and with whom he fathered Fernando Chavarria, whose work in factories and mechanic shops all work at all works or hours of the day. Any shift he was asked to take, he took pride in his work and was committed to a stellar employee wherever he worked. In his community, he lent his talents to his neighbors and often fixed their cars for free, understanding that working people simply deserved a helping hand. He was also a servant leader in his church where he helped uplift members of community in his own quiet yet profoundly powerful ways. He led a life of, of beautiful love and dignity and taught his son by example what it meant to be a faithful and steadfast father and husband. He adored his family and his most precious gifts, his wife and son, Fernando. The second adjournment is um, in honor of Blanca Yadilia Mercedes Vasquez Lobio, who was born on September 24th, 1933 in Sonora, Mexico. She was born to Maria Lobio, a homemaker, and Francisco Vasquez, a farmer. Idalia was spoiled by her parents as she was the baby of the family. She would pretend to be asleep or be sick while others tended to house chores. If she had to work, she convinced her parents to let her work outside where she could enjoy the air and nature. The relationship she had with her dad was very special. She encouraged, he encouraged her to study, secure private school and private tours. He supported her dreams of traveling throughout Mexico several times. 
She also, also learned English and poetry from her American teacher, Thomas Voistick, who, who her father hired to help her develop her skills. She proved to be a wonderful student, earned excellent grades, and she was incredibly smart. She was crowned the Queen of Imuris, a community in Sonora, and was an advocate for justice and equality. She immigrated as a young woman and settled in Los Angeles where she met, her, uh, met Jose Chavarria and mother of their only son, Fernando Chavarria. They created an incredibly tight-knit family and called themselves the Jib family, Jose, Idalia, and Fernando. And like peanut butter, they couldn't be separated. She was incredibly proud of Fernando and instilled in him all the values of family, love, kinship, and caring for other human beings. She was part of the executive leadership team at her church, Friends of Bell Church, for years. Along with her beloved husband, Jose, Idalia would serve others through their church and shelter and supported those in need. She was joyous, funny, and loved deeply. She was most proud of being mother to Fernando, who carries her intellect and heart into the future. She was very happy when he married the love of his life, Azucena, and was over the moon when they became parents to Cielo and Diego Chavarria. Her grandchildren gave her many years of joy, laughter, and magical love. Fernando, Azucena, Diego, and Cielo and are her living legacy on what would have been her 90th birthday. They bid her soul farewell. Both Mr. and Mrs. Chavarria are su survived and live in legacy by their son, one of my best friends, Fernando Chavarria. May they rest in peace. So with that, we take a moment um, to honor all of the lives lost in Israel. Thank you very much. So now, the board will now recess into closed session to consider those matters listed under item 15 on today's regular agenda. If there are any reportable actions, they will be reported out during the planning and land use session of this meeting tomorrow, Wednesday, October 11th, 2023. We'd like to know for the public that tomorrow's session will begin at 10 a.m. That's 10 a.m. on October 11th, 2023. Thank you. Exhibit. It's